we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate that. My name is Susan Luker, and I lead our PSR and Sacrament program here at St. Peter. I wanted to give you a couple reminders today. Um, we do ask if you would need to use the restroom, just go ahead as needed. Um, we don't have gobs of restrooms here in the church, but if it's needed, you'll head to these back, these back double doors and head over to the, my right, your left, um, and there's a restroom there. There's also restrooms down the stairs. Um, we will also open Ursuline Hall if there is a need for that as well. Um, we will have a break, but we ask that during the break that this is a little bit more of a listening break rather than a going into the gathering space and talk break. So if you could please remain in your seat or stand and just stay with your sponsor unless you need to go walk around, we would appreciate that. And if there's a need, we also have some water in the gathering space that you can come get at any time um, if you need that refreshment as well. Uh, lastly, I would like to introduce, no, I'm not gonna actually introduce, but we have a re retreat team here to um, present our retreat to us and they do a fantastic job. So thank you so much and they will introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Um, I want to get us started just to let everybody know a little bit about what's going to be happening today, because I don't know about all of you, but sometimes when I have to come to things like this, I'm just really curious. Oh my gosh, what's going to be happening? Raise your hand if you're curious what's going to be happening. Okay, most people just don't really care, <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things. I'm not going to tell you everything, but I want to tell you a few things. First of all, as you will soon notice, uh, there are four of us here who are going to be the primary presenters, which means there are four of us who would like to give all of you a few things to think about today. Um, we're also hopeful that we will give you a few things to talk about today, but that's kind of up to you. The four of us are members of this group. We're members of a group called MORE, M-O-R-E. And the word MORE is an acronym I'm an English major, so I'm kind of a nerd, and I love acronyms. I think they're really cool. One of my favorites is SCUBA. It stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus. I love that. Another one, I don't know if you know this, is TUBA, and it stands for Terrible Underwater Breathing Apparatus. 
Thanks for laughing. Um, I'll be here all day. And also, the, 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 we're a group called MORE, and MORE is an acronym. I'm gonna tell you briefly what the four letters of MORE stand for. It'll give you a vibe as to who we are. The M stands for Marianist. We are an outreach of this group called, the, or this location, this place in this community, uh, called the Marianist Retreat and Conference Center. The Marianist Retreat Center is outside of this tiny town called Eureka. Has anybody ever been to Eureka or heard of Eureka? Has it, we're like across the street-ish from this place called Hidden Valley. Has anybody ever been to Hidden Valley, the ski place, not the ranch dressing place? That's different. Um, but we're across the street from Hidden Valley. And um, we're also... Uh, our retreat center was founded by a religious order called the Marianists. So a lot of people have heard of the religious order, the Jesuits, that's the Society of Jesus. Pope Francis is a Jesuit, as you may know. We're an outreach of the Marianists, who are the Society of Mary, which means we're dedicated to the most powerful woman in the history of the universe. Her name is Mary. Jesus' mom, you know, we're really big fans of her, um, and we think she's fans of us, we hope. So uh, the M stands for Marianist. The O stands for Outreach. One of the founders of the Marianists is a gentleman named Father Shamanad. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that there is a Catholic school in St. Louis named after him called Shamanad. But Father Shamanad said that our job is to always be on mission with Mary. Um, and Mary's yes brought Jesus to the world, and we try to bring Jesus to the world with our yes, and we believe that he has called us all to be here today, so let's make the most of it. Marianist Outreach, the R stands for Retreat. This is a confirmation retreat, and it's just a chance to think about your life and to think about your relationships with God and with other people, and we're hopeful that'll happen. So the M is Marianist, the O is Outreach, the R is Retreat, and the E stands for Experience, and we believe that this can be an amazing experience today if we all have open hearts. So I'd like to lead us in a prayer for open hearts, if you don't mind, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, please help us to have open hearts, just like your mom. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not all of the retreats we present are sacramental in terms of the capital S, like the seven sacraments, but this one is. This is a confirmation retreat, and so we figured for today we would put the S in front of more and call this event a s'more, um, the delicious campfire treat. Raise your hand if you like s'mores. Me too. Okay. Um, so we hope you like today. Um, and that's just a little bit about who we are. I want to let you know that today our commitment to you is we're going to try our best and we'd like you to try your best. We are not perfect. I like to tell people that at the beginning of any event we do, this will not be a perfect day, uh, but we're going to try and we'd like you to try. So just a little bit about that. We're going to try to talk about things that are important. We're gonna try to do that in ways that'll make sense to everybody here, but we're also gonna mix it up and we're gonna do some things that are a lot more serious and we're gonna do a few things that are a little bit more fun. Raise your hand if you still like to have fun sometimes. Oh my gosh, me too. Um, so we're gonna mix it up between fun and serious. That's our goal, that's our vibe, that's our motto. Um, so we're gonna try and we'd like you to try, here's how. Um, if you could just try to respect whoever's speaking, that would be great. If you could try to participate, that would be great because there'll be chances for you to be involved. Um, we also ask you, this might seem rather strange, but some of us are rather shy. So if you could say hi to us anytime we introduce ourselves, that would be great. Like when I say hi, my name is Paul. If y'all could say hi, Paul. So let's practice that. Hi, my name's Paul. Hi, everybody. And then the final thing we'd like to ask of you, which I believe is the absolute most important thing for the success of today, in my humble opinion, it's so important, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it, but we'd like to ask everybody here, without exception, to please, 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 please 
laugh at our jokes. Thank you, that wasn't a joke. Uh, but we ask you to laugh, our jo laugh at our jokes because we have an amazing tradition that in just a moment, the four of us are gonna introduce ourselves and we'll say hi and tell you our name and then you'll say hi and repeat our name. And then we'll each tell you just a little bit about ourselves and then we're each going to tell you a joke or a series of jokes or a funny story. And I don't know if any of y'all here today have ever tried to tell a joke or a funny story and you think it's really, really funny and when you're done telling it to your friends, they just look at you like you're an idiot. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you, dads. Yes, it happens. Um, so we would ask you to laugh, please, even if you don't think we're funny. It's called charity. We also ask you to laugh even if you're one of those people that don't get jokes. Most of us have at least one friend like that in our friend group who they never get jokes. Um, stop pointing at people, but um, it would be really good if you could just laugh anyway and we'll explain them to you. So that's it. It's so important to me that you laugh at our jokes. I'm going to ask you a little favor. I'm going to count to three. And after I say three, I would like everybody here as well as everybody watching this on live stream at the count of three to please do your best and loudest and fakest laugh. Wait for it. One, two, three. <laughs> huh. All right, thanks. Just fake it till you make it. Um, we are so happy to be here, and so I'm going to pause right now. I'll be back, but I'm going to ask the three people who are on the team with me to come up. Remember, say hi to them, and remember to please laugh at the funny things they have to say they're actually a pretty funny crew, in my opinion. Hi, everyone. My name's Denise. Hi. Hello. So let me tell you a little bit about me. Number one, I always think it's super awkward coming up to the altar every time to bow, or I always panic. Do I genuflect? Do I bow? So I did like kind of half thing. Raise your hand if you noticed. Good, okay, yeah, he did. Um, so here's a little bit about me. I, um, I'm 42 years old, hashtag fun fact. I uh, am married to my husband and I have two stepsons. One is married also and one is engaged, so it's really exciting because we just had a really great Christmas and everyone came home. It was lovely. Uh, we also, um, we got a new puppy. Does anyone here have a dog at home or a puppy? Yes, God bless you all. My puppy is three months old, and it's a monster. It's a blue healer. Uh, if you've never heard of a blue healer, it's also called a, uh, an Australian cattle dog. And so he thinks I'm a cow and will walk, like chase me around and uh, like bite my heels, blue healer, bite my heels, and bark at me, like no matter where I'm going. So it's very hurtful. Like, I, I'm not a cow, but... It's maybe inspired me to um, get back on the, the low carb wagon a little bit. So I have the best job in the world. First, you have to know about me. I love reading. Does anyone else love reading? Okay, I love streaming everything, and sometimes I combine that where I read and stream at the same time. I also love wearing costumes. Yes. So I have the best job in the world where I combine reading and wearing costumes. So part of my job is I get to dress up like a big red dog and go to schools and go to book fairs and wave with the kids. And it's amazing. So my job is um, I work at Scholastic Book Fairs and that's part of my job. And yes, also for fun, um, we keep bees. We're beekeepers because again, the costume, right? I got the whole like beekeeper outfit with the veil so I don't get stung or die. And um, during the, we started doing this during the pandemic, like right at the beginning. So this is a true story. It's not, it's my joke. But I went to the store with my husband and we're like, okay, we're gonna start being beekeepers. I have the costume, I have the hive ready to go, it's empty. So we just need bees to fill it. And so we go to Petco where you can buy bees I don't think you can, but we went to Petco and the guy behind the counter was like, all right, so how many bees do you want? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I look at my husband, how many bees should we start with? And he, he, we look at each other, we have no idea because obviously we haven't taken a class or watched a YouTube video or anything yet. Um, that's another story. And 
Uh, I'm like, a dozen? We'll start with a dozen bees. He's like, all right, so let's start with a dozen bees. The guy turns around, opens the bee cage, grabs some bees, puts them in a container, hands them to me, closes the bee cage. And uh, he's like, here you are. I'm counting them because, again, I want to make sure I'm getting all the bees I'm paying for. Yes, that's just me. And I count, there's 13 bees. And I was like, excuse me, sir, this is a baker's dozen? Like, these are not donuts, I'm not gonna eat one. I just wanted a dozen. So that just means 12, but you gave me 13. And he's like, yeah, that extra one, it's a freebie. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name's Luke. Hey, how's it going? Um, I guess a few things about me. I live in St. Louis. Anybody else here live in St. Louis? Cool. I actually live in Webster Grove, so I'm your, I'm your neighbors here to those who live here in Kirkwood. Uh, grew up here my whole life. I went to DeSmet Jesuit High School. Anyone else here thinking about DeSmet or went to DeSmet? Okay, it's a great school. I went to St. Louis University for college. Go Bills. Any, any Billikens out there? Anybody like Billiken basketball at least? Okay, a few more. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I currently work at an e-commerce software company um, that's based in Brentwood, so that's kind of cool. Besides that, um, normally I say I'm a big Cardinals fan, and I am, but right now, obviously, big into the Blues. Any Blues fans out there? Anybody watch the Winter Classic last weekend? That was a pretty fun one. Yeah, cool. Um, and then, let's see, two other things that I recently have gotten into. Um, Star Wars. So I always avoided Star Wars growing up because the times I've heard, Luke, I am your father, it just turned me off to it. Um, but over the holiday break, you know, who has Disney Plus? Any Disney Plus fans out there? I watched the whole series. I'm loving it. I'm about to start The Mandalorian. Um, so if you want to talk Star Wars later, hit me up because uh, now, now I'm into it. And then the other thing is um, every like weekday I watch, I've gotten into like YouTube and I watch this YouTube channel called Good Mythical Morning with Rhett and Link. Any mythical beasts out there? Nope, okay, won't mention that one again. That's awkward. Um, well, hey, uh, one more thing you should know about me um, is that I love farm animal jokes. Um, big fan, so I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite farm animal jokes. If you have another farm animal joke I don't mention, please let me know and I'll add it to the repertoire. So what do you, what do you call a cow with only two legs? Lean beef. What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. <laughs> what do you call a sheep with no legs? A cloud. <laughs> what do you call a cloud? <laughs> Sorry. What, what do you call a cow in an earthquake? A milkshake. <laughs> what do you call a cow that twitches a lot? Beef jerky. <laughs> what do you call a cow that just joked over a barbed wire fence? Utter destruction. <laughs> what do you call a cow that just gave birth? Decaffeinated. <laughs> Why did the pig walk into the kitchen? Because he felt like bacon. <laughs> What do you, why, what does a wicked chicken lay? Deviled eggs. Why does a chicken come up with only two doors? Because if it had four doors, it'd be a chicken sedan. Why, what do you call a horse that goes out after dark? A nightmare. Okay, this is the last one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what did the horse say when he starred in the Life Alert commercial? Help, I've fallen and can't giddy up. Thank you. My name is Bart. Uh, so he asked me to tell you a little something about myself. Uh, first of all, I realize I think we're live streaming here. Uh, for all of you at home, uh, the camera definitely puts on 20 pounds. It's, these guys can tell you I'm super skinny. Um, so let's see a little something. I'm from Sacred Heart, right down the street on the other side. Uh, anybody here know from Sacred Heart? I got one, I got one parishioner with me. All right, awesome. Um, I got to behave then, I guess. Uh, let's see, what about me? Um, let's see, I'm 28 years old, twice, <laughs> plus one. Uh, let's see, what else about me? Um, uh, I like hockey as well. I did go to the SMED. I also went to SLU as well. Um, oh, great news from the doctor. I'm eight months pregnant, expecting a boy. <laughs> Just kidding, it's really a girl. Uh, let's see, what else do I got? Um, oh, I do actually have two girls. One's married, uh, lives in Kansas City. The other one is engaged. She's down in Cape Girardeau. So hopefully later on this year, both of them will be off the payroll. Uh, that's always exciting. Um, 
What else, man? Um, I do. I do work. Uh, I have a very, very difficult job. Um, you know, I don't know if I would encourage this anybody else, but uh, it's a tough job. So what I do, and I have to do this like every single day, and uh, I know it's it, it's 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 tough, but uh, my job is to eat ice cream every single day. <laughs> I know. I mean, how does he do it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do own an ice cream shop, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun, but it can be difficult sometimes. Uh, for instance, this one day, we just happened to be out of uh, chocolate ice cream. And I had a customer come up, and he goes, uh, I, I would like three scoops of chocolate ice cream. And I said, oh man, I am so sorry. I said, you know, we, we just happened to be out of, of chocolate ice cream today. Is there anything else I can help you with? He goes, well, he looks at the menu, and I'll take two scoops of chocolate ice cream. I'm like, come on, guy, I, I, you know, I, I'm all out of chocolate ice cream. You know, look at my menu and, and, and let me know, is there anything else I can help you with? So he's looking and finally he goes, all right, I'll take one scoop of ice, uh, chocolate ice cream. I'm like, all right, dude, bear with me here. Can you spell van like in vanilla ice cream? And that guy's like, all right, V-A-N. Great, that's awesome. How about straw like in strawberry ice cream? I was like, S-T-R-A-W. That's awesome. That's good. Can you spell stink like in chocolate ice cream? And he goes, well, there's no stink in chocolate. I go, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Paul. Hi, everybody. A little bit about myself. I'm 58 years old. That's not my joke. It's not funny at all. And I'm married, my wife's name is Lisa, and she's really pretty, so yay me. Um, I live in this part of St. Louis called Maryland Heights. Um, although I live in Maryland Heights, I'm a country boy at heart. I love all things outdoors. Who enjoys being outdoors? Please raise your hand if you enjoy doing any of these things outdoors. Sometimes when I'm outdoors, I love to do nothing and I'm really good at it. Um, I also like to go for walks and I like to go hiking and our family does a lot of camping. We like camping um, and I also like fishing. Anybody like fishing? But my favorite is hunting. I'm an avid deer hunter. Any deer hunters in the house? Uh, if we could talk. Um, I had a really good deer season this year. My freezer is full and so is my heart. And I uh, grew up in a family with five sisters. I don't have any brothers, so that's why I understand women. <laughs> that was a joke, yeah. Um, and uh, let's see, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, one thing about me, I don't know if any of y'all can relate to this, but I'm one of those people that I have a lot of awkward moments that happen in my life. Raise your hand if you have a lot of awkward moments that happen in your life, any awkward people. Okay, it's awkward to raise your hand to admit it. Um, and I have a, uh, for you, uh, a, a hilarious series of doctor jokes. These are totally dad jokes. So if you love dad jokes, buckle up. If you hate dad jokes, get ready to roll your eyes. Since it's a series of doctor jokes, they're going to require a little bit of patience. Patients. Yeah, okay. Um, so there is this doctor, extremely talented, could diagnose the weirdest conditions that people had. So he shows up on a Monday morning, and there are four people in the waiting room who have issues they can't figure out. So the first guy comes into the doctor's office and he said, Doctor, I don't know what's going on. I seem to hurt everywhere. And the doctor says, you hurt everywhere? Guy's like, yeah, doc, watch this. Ow! 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 Doctor said, sir, I know what's wrong with you. You have a broken finger. So, so the second guy walks into the doctor's office and he said, Doc, I just don't feel good. Doctor's like, tell me more. He's like, no, Doc, just check me out. So the doctor checks this guy out and notices that he has corn jammed up both of his nostrils. 
and he has green beans stuffed into each of his ears. And the doctor said, sir, I know what's wrong with you. You're not eating right. So, <laughs> so the third guy goes into the doctor's office and he's like, doc, my leg. I don't know what's wrong with my leg, but it's weird. So the doctor said, tell me more. He said, no, doc, take your stethoscope and listen to my knee. And the doctor listens to his knee and hears a voice coming out of his knee saying, give me $5. Doc's like, that's weird. He's like, no, doc, listen to my shin. And the doctor does, and here's a voice coming out of his shin saying, could I have $50, please? Doc's like, that is so weird. He's like, no, doc, listen to my ankle. And the doctor hears a voice coming out of this guy's ankle saying, could I have $100? As soon as possible, I'd really appreciate it. Doctor says, sir, this is so weird, but I think I figured out what's wrong with you. Your leg, it's broke. In three places. <laughs> Finally, stop. Finally, this pregnant lady walks into this doctor's office, last patient of the morning. And she's, this pregnant lady says, Doc, I don't know what's going on, but every two minutes or so, I find myself just shouting, wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't, can't, wouldn't, shouldn't, couldn't, can't. And the doctor said, don't worry about it, ma'am. Those are just contractions. Thank you. Um, we are so happy to be here, and I hope it's cool with all of you, uh, but we're kind of obsessed. We don't like to get serious right away. I promise we will, um, but we also like to have a little bit of fun. And so to get things kind of really popping, yeah, I said popping, uh, and to get everybody's energy up, we're going to get started now by playing a game. So everybody say yay. Come on, say yay, yay, yay. All right. Um, and this is a takeoff of a famous game that maybe some of you played when you were younger. Maybe some of you still play. I don't know what you do. But raise your hand if you've ever played a game called Simon Says. Has anybody ever played that? Okay, we're not playing that game. It's stupid. Uh, we're going to play a different game. We're going to play the official more team version and in my opinion it's a lot cooler in my opinion it's a lot funner yeah um, and so I'm gonna explain the rules of the game now if you look at my friends on the more team they're gonna be nodding in agreement that you need to listen very carefully to the rules of this game or you will do very very poorly so please listen the rules are extremely important. First of all, the name of the game is called God Says, not Simon Says. And since it's called God Says, the first most important rule of this game is that I'm God. Don't ever forget that. The other rules include the following. Here they are. You got to do what God says when God says to do it. If God doesn't say to do it, don't do it. The game does not begin until God says the game begins. Nor is the game over. God says it's over. God go back to says no. Keep, keep your eyes on God. Any questions about the game or the rules? I will repeat them one more time, a little more slowly for those who are playing at home. Uh, the game is called God Says and I'm God. Not really, just for the game. And you have to do what God says when God says to do it. But if God doesn't say to do it, don't do it. This game does not begin until God says the game begins, nor is this game over until God says this game's over. Now here's a really tricky part. I'm warning you, this is very tricky. You have to do what God says, which may not be what God does, and you need to keep your eyes on God, looking at God at all times, just to be very clear. It's a lot like Simon Says. Most of you've played or you've seen it played. In Simon Says, you know, you know, you know, the leader of the game is Simon but you should never, ever, ever do anything in Simon Says unless those two words, Simon Says, come first. Same way with this game. Although I am God, don't do anything unless those two words, God Says, come first. Got it? Good. I want to let you know that the last person standing at the end of this game is going to receive 
three really cool prizes. All right, so there will be three prizes for the winner of this game. If there are no questions, everybody go ahead and stand up. We'll get started, go ahead and stand up. That is the oldest trick in the book. I can't believe you fell for that. Oh my gosh, that is so embarrassing, so embarrassing. Raise your hand if you didn't fall for that trick. God didn't say to raise your hands, you're all out too. Well, that was fun. Um, no, I'm gonna let you go on a technicality because if you are listening carefully to the rules, you heard me say that one of the rules is the game does not begin until God says the game begins. So that game hasn't started. So you can't be out of a game that hasn't started. So everybody's still in the game, okay? So God says stand up. God never said the game started. I just explained that. Oh my gosh. Some of y'all are terrible at this game because it hasn't even started yet and you've messed up a couple times. It does not look good for your future. I mean, in this game, okay. Um, but uh, even though some of you've messed up twice, you still can't be out because God never said the game started, but I was just having some fun. So God says the game begins now. God says, stand up. And God would highly encourage those who are watching this live stream to try to see how well you can do against God in this game. God says, sit down. God says, stand up. God says, sit down. Isn't this fun? God says, stand up. God says, put your hands up. God says, put your hands down. Put your hands up. No, 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 no. God says, put your hands down. No. God says, put your hands on your hips. God says, touch your ears, touch your nose. Hands up, your hands should not be up. Hands down, your hands should not be down. God says, put your hands down. God feels bad for the people who are out already because it didn't take you long. And one of the things that those of you who are out, I hope you've learned about God, especially as you're going through the confirmation process, I hope you've learned that God always forgives. It's true. It's my favorite characteristic of God. So since God is so forgiving, those of you who are out can come back in. Stand back up for a second. God didn't say you could come back in. <laughs> That's my favorite trick. God says come back in for real. God says everybody stand up. God says everybody's back in the game. All right. Um, God says, however, we are now moving into the final championship round. God also says this will be a lightning fast speed round. Oh yeah. God also says from this point forward, any mistake, even the most minor mistake in your out. So God says, you know, if your hands are up and I say something like put your hands down and you go, that's major, but also a minor mistake in your out. So even if your hands are up and I say put your hands down and you go, and you're like, oh, I was just fixing my, no, you're out, okay? So, and God says some of you are having difficulty being honest about your mistakes, no offense, but you are. Um, so God is officially appointing Bart as a judge. Bart, come over here and judge this side of the room. God is officially appointing Luke to help to judge the center of the room. And God is officially appointing Denise to help to judge this side of the room, my right God says, if God or one of God's judges calls you out, you are out. God says all of their decisions are final. And God says, whoever is the last person standing, that person will receive three really cool prizes. Now, things are going to move really quickly, so you might want to loosen it up just a little bit. Go ahead and loosen. If you did that, you're out. Goodbye. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Simon says, hands up. That was Simon, not God. If you put your hands up, you're out. Simon's like a false prophet, okay? So God says, put your hands down. <laughs> if you flinched, you're out. God says, put your hands up. God says, put your hands down. God says, touch your ears. Touch your nose. Hands up. No, your hands should not be up. Put your hands down. God, no, your hands should not be down. God says, put your hands down. Put your hands on your hips. Touch your ears. If you're touching your ears, you're out. God didn't say to touch your ears. Hands down. God says hands up. Hands down. No. <laughs> See ya. God says put your hands down. Put your hands up. 
No, ma'am, you're gone. God says put your hands down. <laughs> See ya. Okay. Um, actually, um, God says, I, 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 God says, uh, God says, Bart, have a seat. God says, Luke and Denise, have a seat. Because God says now everybody who is out, you are all officially appointed as judges. Y'all are excited to judge people. <laughs> it's disturbing. Um, but God says, judges, we need to pay close attention to our remaining participants uh, to make sure any mistakes that we call them out so we can have a final winner. So God says, judges, turn around if you need to. Here we go. God says, put your hands down. God says, put your hands up. God says, touch your ears. God says, put your hands on your hips. Touch your nose. Uh-uh, bye. Hands up. God says, put your hands down. Bye. Put your hands on your hips. Okay, God says, put your hands on your knees. Put your hands up. God says, put your hands down. God says, say hi. If you waved, you're out. God didn't say to wave. Oh my gosh, that took everybody out. <laughs> that was awesome. God says, if you got taken out by waving, please stand back up, because we really need to have a winner. So I want to make it really easy on the judges to figure out who of our finalists uh, make mistakes and who don't. So here's what I need. Uh, God says judges, listen up, we got to be tough on them. But I want to make it easy on the judges. So I need the four of you to please come forward and line up right here facing the crowd. So come on up. If you started to move, you're out. God didn't say to come forward. Oh. And it appears that we have a winner. What's your name? Kyle, God didn't ask your name, so sit down. No, uh, <laughs> that was rude, wasn't it? Okay, Kyle actually is our winner, so God says the game is over now. Uh, Kyle, God said the game is over. If you could please come up and claim your three fabulous prizes, that would be great. The first fabulous prize that Kyle gets for winning the game is a standing ovation from everyone in the church, come on, give it up for Kyle, give it up for Kyle. The second, go ahead and sit down, and God said the game's over so you can actually sit down. Uh, the second fabulous prize, Kyle, you receive is a limited edition collector's item, in fact, vintage, Marianist Retreat Center pen. <laughs> applause, 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 yeah. And the third fabulous prize is a Got Chocolate Milk lanyard. I told you we had really cool prizes. Let's give Kyle another round of applause. <coughs> Thank you all for playing. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to actually move right in to our first serious portion of the retreat. I want to set it up by saying a couple things that are really important that I think will help all of us to get the most out of this first serious session of the retreat. Since people learn things different ways, we try to communicate things different ways, and we're gonna do our first session by presenting to you a little skit. It's just this little drama, um, and a couple things important about the drama. First of all, I assure you, we are not professional actors nor actresses. This is not going to be a Broadway production. It's just a little skit, a little drama that has a really good message. Um, we also use props that are just not great. They're kind of lame because we're kind of on a budget. Um, and also, uh, after we do this little drama, you will hear from the other three members of the team. And quite simply, what they're going to do is they're going to share with you how the message of this drama relates with their lives. That's all. A couple, three short talks. And then, heads up, after you've heard from the three other members of the team, you're going to have an opportunity to talk among yourselves. So we don't ask much, but we do ask that you would tune in, those of you who are watching at home. Uh, that you would be aware if you're not if you're at home and you're not with your sponsor uh, when the time comes for discussion we'd encourage you to call or FaceTime your sponsor 
or find somebody else that you can talk to, maybe your little brother or your mom or your dad or your dog or your goldfish, whatever. Um, but you will have a chance to talk among yourselves after you've heard from members of the team. The drama is called Masks, M-A-S-K-S. -S. It is not about these kind of COVID protection masks, uh, but it's about the masks that we can sometimes wear. And uh, before we do the drama, I'd like to lead us in a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, help us just to get the most out of this little drama and to get the most out of the three talks that follow and help us to get the most out of the discussion time that we're gonna have in just a few minutes, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Team, come on up. Wait, wait, was that you that I saw going to church last Sunday? Like, what, really? <laughs> what? No way, that wasn't me. <laughs> I hate church. <laughs> you are such a liar. I know that was you. I saw you at church with your whole entire family. And you know what, Bart, you even looked happy to be there. I thought I saw you like singing and responding. Seriously, who does that? Are you gonna be, wait, I know, you're gonna be a priest. You're gonna be Father Bart. Should we start calling you Father Bart? <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine, you got me, but uh, so what if it was me? It's not that I enjoy church. It is totally boring. I only go because my parents make me go. Actually, I really do enjoy going to church. It's, it's, it's a chance for my family with soccer and everything else, we just don't have a lot of time to spend together, and a lot of times we'll go out to eat afterwards, and, and I, I do enjoy it, and, and I really do love God, and believe it or not, I, I like to pray, and, and every time I have any kind of a problem or anything, it seems like when I pray, all of a sudden, I feel a lot better, but I can't let Denise know that. I mean, that's not cool, man. She's going to make fun of me, and and call me, you know, a churchgoer and everything else. And so, you know, I just, I just, I, I just can't really tell her how I really feel. Yeah, I really hate church. <laughs> it's the worst. Yes. Hey, Luke. Hey, Paul. Uh, this party's a little bit boring. So I was wondering if you want to hit off my jewel. Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, Luke, no, no, no. It goes the other way. Oh. <laughs> um, what is your problem? Haven't you ever vaped before? Uh, of course I have. I vape all the time. I just, I just wasn't looking, all right? Actually, Paul's right. I haven't ever vaped before, and I don't know why I'm starting now. My older brother actually vapes, and I hate it. He's always sneaking away from family events to go do it, and... I actually had two grandparents that passed away from smoking, and I know there's a lot of nicotine in this, and I want to be healthy. I would never thought that I'd start vaping, but I don't know. As Paul said, it's kind of a lame party, and nobody wants to hear about the evils of vaping or smoking at a party, so I guess now is as good as a, t as a time as any to start. Ah, yeah. Oh, man, this tastes so good. Oh, yeah. It's so weird. I know that Luke has never vaped before. I can't believe he just took the jewel from me right now. Honestly, I wish I would have never started. It's become a really bad habit for me. It's so expensive. I'm always hiding it from my parents. And the weird thing about him taking the jewel is I remember a couple years ago he shared with me that it really bothers him that his brother vapes so much. And I remember I was the only one from our class that went to his grandpa's funeral. His grandpa had died of lung cancer, and we actually made a commitment to each other that we wouldn't do chemicals at that funeral. And 
I don't know what we're doing or why. Um, I feel really stupid that I'm the one that gave it to him. It's already affecting my ability on the soccer field. I can't run like I used to. And I hope he doesn't get hooked like me. But whatever, right? I mean, it's whatever. It's his problem now, so whatever. Uh, yeah, Luke, vaping is the best. Oh, definitely. All the cool kids do it. Like, like us. Like us. We're oh, yeah. so cool. Oh my gosh, Luke, hey, hey, wasn't that a great party we were at last weekend? A lot of really, really fun people were there. <laughs> oh, I know, Bart and Paul and Susan were all there. Yeah. But did you see that one guy that showed up, that big loser, the one with the weird clothes? <laughs> what, oh. what was his name? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I know, um, oh yeah, yeah, are you talking about that one guy, Tom? Tom, Tim, Ted, whatever. I think he's really strange. I mean, seriously, did you see the clothes that he was wearing? Those must have been off the clearance rack at Walmart. Or wait, no, I know. My little brother donated them to Goodwill last year. Man, that kid is such a loser. Oh my God, you are totally right, Luke. He, he's really different. <laughs> Actually, listen, Tom's a really good friend of mine. Uh, we, we've been friends forever, like a really long time since school I think we live in the same neighborhood our, our parents are friends with each other we used to hang out all the time and I know the real reason why he's wearing clothes like this both his parents lost their jobs like during the COVID pandemic and they don't have extra money to buy clothes so what he does is tells his parents buy stuff for my little brother and not for me I'll be okay but Luke doesn't know that Luke doesn't even know that I'm friends with them Luke doesn't know that history. And really, Luke will just make fun of me if he knows that I'm friends with Tom. I feel so bad talking about Tom like this, but honestly, like Luke's never gonna know, right? Or, or Tom's never gonna know that we're talking about him like this. He's never gonna find out, right? Oh my gosh, Luke, yeah, totally. That kid Tom, I'm telling you, total loser. I can't stand loser. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Hey, Bart. Hey, when I called you last night about your math homework, what was all the yelling about in the background? Oh, yeah, sorry about that yelling. It was just my parents. They're just really loud, I guess. Well, I, I heard that they're getting a divorce. Is, it, is that true? Wait, you heard they're getting a divorce? How did you hear that? Your sister. She was talking about it with some of her friends, and, and the word just got out. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, they are splitting up, but, you know, the sooner the better. It doesn't bother you at all? It doesn't bother me that much. Uh, so here's the thing, Bart. They're just my stupid parents. I'm sick of hearing them fight. And I've heard from some of my friends that when your parents get divorced, you can tell your mom you're at your dad's, and you can tell your dad you're at your mom's, and then you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. And My birthday's coming up, so I'll probably get twice as many presents. You know, I need more stuff, so it's no big deal. Actually, it's a really, really big deal. Um, I'm going through the worst time in my life right now. I would never admit this to Bart, but lately I've been crying myself to sleep because my heart's just broken. My parents have always fought, but I never thought they would get divorced. and It's so awkward. My dad always talks bad about my mom to me. And my mom always tells me everything she hates about my dad. And I feel just caught up in the middle and I don't know what to do. But I don't want to bother Bart with my problems. He has enough troubles of his own, you know? And besides, I have a reputation at school of always being the funny guy. So, you know, when you're the funny guy, you don't want to bring other people down with your problems, right? I'm sure I'll probably be fine. 
So, Paul, you, you, you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. I'll talk to you later. Hey, Luke, what's going on? Hey, did you have a good time at that party we were at this last weekend? Oh, my gosh, we're going to so many parties. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I had a great time, Denise, but not as good as a time as you. Am I right? Uh, Man, that was pretty awesome. There was so much <laughs> beer there. It was an amazing <laughs> party. Oh, you, yeah, you know, you know. Um, I saw the beer, but, you know, I don't really drink beer very much anymore. What? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Do you really expect me to believe that? You were the most wasted person at that party. Dancing on a table with a lampshade on your head, singing along to Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus. <laughs> you even snuck off for a while with Eugene. Don't tell me you weren't wasted because you had to be drunk to be hooking up with Eugene. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you're, you're right. Look, I, I did drink. Here's the deal. It wasn't beer. I was not drinking beer. I am beyond beer, okay? Beer is for babies. Hashtag amateur hour. Let me tell you what happened. I drank an entire pint of Jack Daniels whiskey before I even got to that party. And that party was the best. It was the best. And that was the best buzz I have ever had. I have never had so much fun in my life. Actually, that party, it was the worst, the worst night of my life. And let me tell you why. I thought it was just gonna be some friends, like going over to a friend's house. We're gonna watch some movies, maybe order pizza. And that's how it started. But then all of a sudden, all these other people kept coming over and showing up. And my friend's parents weren't home. I didn't know that, but they weren't. And they brought beer, they brought drinks. I didn't wanna be the only one not drinking. So I held it in my hand for a long time, but then eventually, I started drinking just to fit in. And I'll tell you, it was pretty fun, but I did some stuff that like I don't even remember doing, but it's out there on social media so everyone remembers it now. This guy Eugene, I have no clue who that guy is, but apparently I did some stuff and made some really bad decisions. And I don't want this to be how high school goes for me. I don't want people to know me as the party girl because that's not me. That's not who I was created to be. That's not, yeah. The scariest part though, I don't even know how I got home that night. I don't remember that part. That's not safe, that's not cool. But here's the deal, my friends, including Luke, all my friends, they drink. There's really nothing else to do on the weekend. So I'm hoping that next weekend, whatever that our friend group has planned, I am hoping, I am praying that it is not another party. I just hope it's something else. Please, not a party. Oh my gosh, Luke, totally. That was such a great party. So tell me, what is going on next weekend? Oh, next weekend, the party's at Bart's house. Oh. And Denise, you've got to be there. Because you've got to be wasted. Mm -hmm. I think we're even going to all pitch in and buy the jack for you because you're so much fun when you're drinking. Are you in? I mean, yeah, you know, if there's a party, I'm, I'm going to be there, yeah. Um, hey, Luke. Yeah? This is kind of weird, but when you were just talking to Denise, I got a text on my phone from your mom. What? Apparently, your mom needs you to go home right now, so you better go see what that's about. What? M wait, my mom was texting you? What? Oh my gosh, Luke, Luke, it's so crazy. She's been tweeting at me. I didn't even know she had Twitter. Like, I, me, yeah. Me yeah, and it looks like your mom, she set up an Instagram account, and there's a picture of you on it. I mean, seriously, it says, hashtag, go home. Wow, that's so weird. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna go see what's going on, but hey, I'll catch you all later. Um, call me or, or text me, who calls anymore? Text me, you know, uh, let me know what's going on. Um, so. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah, we'll text you. Not, oh my gosh, Denise. Yeah. 
Thank you for helping me to get rid of him. He is such a loser. I cannot stand him. Oh my gosh, he is trying so hard to be cool, but it is so not working. I mean, do you remember he was like vaping? Yeah, I know. Yeah, who does that? And he was pretending he knew how to do it. Ugh, really? I know. I can see right through all that. I think Luke is so fake. Oh my gosh, that is totally it, Paul. He is totally fake. But look at me. Talking about my good friend Luke behind his back. I guess that makes me fake too. Yeah, I guess I can be pretty fake too because I hate it. I hate it when people talk about me behind my back and now I'm talking about Luke behind his back. I guess it's just because I've been so hurt. I find myself hurting other people. But I don't want to be this way anymore. They might be fake, but I'm not. <laughs> That's just the way I am. I mean, did they think I couldn't hear them? I wasn't standing that far away. It really hurts when your friends are talking about you behind your back. But what hurts more is when they're right. I am pretty fake. Are you? Hi, my name's Luke. Hey, how's it going? And that was the drama called Masks. And as Paul said, I'm just going to share a few thoughts from my own life experience. Um, who here is, has ever been to the store J.C. Penney's? Yeah, okay, well, uh, yeah, it's one of those stores you kind of forget about, especially since we don't go to malls anymore. Um, but I have a very specific memory of being at J.C. Penney's with my mom when I was in middle school, when I was in seventh grade. We were there to, I don't know, pick up a tie or something. But on the way to the register, my mom pulled me over to a rack of clothes and showed me this t-shirt right here. It says, got Jesus. So two things you should know about me at this point in my life as a middle schooler. One, that Got Milk campaign, you know, the athletes with the milk mustaches, was alive and well when I was in middle school, just like I'm sure it is now. Milk was kind of a daily part of my life. I drank it in the morning. I like milk and I like puns, and this was clearly a reference to that campaign. The second thing you should know about me is I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic grade school. Um, I went to mass on Sundays with my parents. I raised my hand in religion class. I sang in the all school choir at all school masses. And I even prayed to Jesus. He was kind of a day to day part of my life, like milk as well. So when my mom offered to buy me the shirt, I said, yeah, sure, it's, it says a couple things about me, it's kind of punny, great. Didn't really think a lot about it. Until that coming Friday evening, it was the seventh grade girls CYC soccer championship game. Place to be on a Friday night. When I was in seventh grade, I don't go to those anymore. Um, but uh, it was one of those coming of age times where my class was gonna be getting together outside of school um, and be, be hanging out you know, on the blacktop at, uh, on a Friday evening. And it was one of those rare opportunities that I had where I wasn't gonna be in my school uniform and I actually got to choose what I wanted to wear. So I went to the closet and I pulled out you know, the best pair of khaki cargo shorts I could find. Um, but I also pulled out my new shirt because it was something new, I, you know, I thought it was something cool or interesting, whatever. Didn't think much of it. But when I showed up on the blacktop at my grade school that evening, a lot of other people thought a lot about this shirt, and none of it was kind or nice. And I was torn apart, I was made fun of the entire night because I showed up with a shirt that said Jesus on it. And that must mean I'm a Jesus freak, I'm a God kid, priest boy, oh, Father Luke is here. I was hanging out with literally like my classmates that we'd gone to mass together that, that earlier that day, but because I showed up and I had this name on my chest, I was the butt of every joke and it ripped me apart. And I got home that night extremely hurt, and I ripped off this shirt and I threw it in the closet. And what I realize now is that when I threw my shirt in the closet, I threw my faith in the closet as well and I put up this huge mask. Because let me explain that. I saw and I felt how people treated me when I had that name across my chest. 
Not only did I not want to wear that shirt, but I did not want anyone to have that impression that it would be across my chest. And so I consciously and subconsciously started to change things about me because I didn't want people to think that that word would appear here. I still had to go to church on Sundays with my parents, but I'd sit there with my arms crossed. I stopped raising my hand in religion class, even if I knew the answer. I dropped out of the choir for all school masses. I even stopped praying with Jesus. Like, one-on-one -on -one closed doors, I even started to cut that off because I was so obsessed with not being treated by my friends in the way that they had that I got lost behind that mask. That went on for months, but luckily, in middle school, I got to go on a retreat that was not too different from this one. We talked about confirmation, about the Holy Spirit, and the importance of being authentic selves because that's where the Holy Spirit moves, through authenticity. Holy Spirit's not fake. It's as real as you can get, and therefore, if we want the Holy Spirit in our lives, we cannot be fake vessels. We have to be our authentic selves. That made an impact on me coming out of that retreat. I reflected, I realized I'd been wearing this mask, but it, that, before that was so close to me, I was blinded by it, and I wanted to start taking it down, and the first opportunity that I had to do that in a really external way was that coming Thursday at school was a dress-down day. Normally we wore uniforms, but this was a day to wear whatever you wanted. Guess what I chose to wear that day? I pulled this back out of the closet and I wore it to school. Now I'm gonna to be totally honest, I thought it was a low stakes, a low risk situation because all my classmates had just been on the same retreat. Surely they wouldn't make fun of me now. Spoiler, they did. I still got made fun of just as much that day. But even if my classmates hadn't changed or there's just their hearts weren't on that same trajectory path that I was at that time, I changed or I wanted to be changing. And yeah, every time they threw an insult at me that day, I wanted to throw my mask back up and go, oh, I know, it's, it's a stupid shirt I wore to be ironic or everything else I had was dirty in the laundry. Yeah, I don't know why I wore it. But instead, I kept that mask down. And I didn't spit anything back at them, but in that I was saying, hey, this is me and this is something that matters to me. And that was such a powerful opportunity for me to truly stand up for Jesus in my day to day in that physical way that the next month when there was the next dress down day coming down you know, the road, I asked my mom if we could go back to JCPenney's because I knew there was still a rack of clothes there that had other Jesus shirts. And I chose to get one and wear a different one. And yeah, people still made fun of me, but a little bit less. And yeah, I wanted to put the mask back up, but a little bit less because I was getting stronger. And then throughout the rest of middle school, every month I wore a different shirt as my way of standing up. And some pretty cool things happened. By the end of eighth grade year, I wasn't being made fun of anymore. Maybe the humor had worn off. But more importantly, I'd been opening myself up to the, how the Holy Spirit wanted to be stirring in my life and to be authentic, that my classmates expected that name Jesus to be across my shirt, not just on the one dress down day, but on the other 29 days of the month as well and how I was acting and treating and growing as a human. I made some better relationships and friendships through that experience and then primed me for high school as well as it allowed me to have the best relationship that I can through confirmation with the Holy Spirit by being an authentic vessel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bart. So how many of you here know that um, Mary is the mother of Jesus? All right, and how many of you know that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Okay, so does that mean that Mary had a little lamb? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So why, why do we wear masks? Is it because we want to be somebody else? Is it because we're not happy with who we are? So I've been here for a little while now, and I want to tell you how awesome each and every one of you really are. And I look around, and God just did a totally awesome job with you guys. But guess what? I don't want to disappoint you, but none of us are perfect. So why the mask? Why do we want to, to be someone else if they're not perfect either? I want to tell you about a mask that I used to wear. When I was six years old, my dad, he got cancer, and he died. And as if that wasn't bad enough, our house caught on fire, my brother got scared, and he hid in his closet. When the firefighters finally found him, he had already died. 
My brother, he was only four years old. These were very difficult times for me. I really missed my dad. And many nights, I would cry myself to sleep. Can any of you relate to that? Laying in bed, just crying, by yourself, lonely, afraid, not sure what to do. People would ask me if I was okay. So I would put on my mask and I'd say yes. But nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I wasn't okay, not even close. So maybe you have lost a parent or a loved one. Maybe your parents are going through a divorce and that really bothers you. Maybe you're being bullied at school and you just don't know how to deal with it. So you too lay in bed at night and cry. Maybe you or a loved, you or a loved one has an illness and sometimes you stop and ask, why me? I know I ask that all the time. Whatever the reason we put on that mask and we pretend everything is all right, when in reality, we are really struggling with it. When I was younger, I was afraid. The more afraid I got, the bigger the mask I would put on. So I guess I never realized when I was younger that the mask that I was putting on wasn't fixing my problems, but was actually delaying the help that I could have been getting. Now that I'm older and I look back during those times in my life, I realize that I wish I could have been strong enough to lower my mask and not only be truthful to others, but be truthful to myself. So who do we turn to to help remove our mask? Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a teacher. I'm sure if you asked a teacher, for a few minutes of their time, they'd be more than willing to help you. Maybe it's a priest. A lot of them have gone through the same things that we've gone through. They're great people to talk to. One of my favorite options is your youth minister. Youth ministry is a great place to go to, to take down your mask, and to be yourself. Maybe person sitting right next to you. Maybe your sponsor is that person that you can turn to and, and share what, struggling, what you're struggling with. Sponsors, as a sponsor myself, it is such a privilege when someone asks us to be a sponsor. But sometimes as adults, we feel we have to have that magic answer, or we feel we have to give the best advice. But in reality, the best thing that we can do is just listen. The best thing we can do is best described by St. Francis of Assisi. And he says, always preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. Today, we are going through a pandemic. Many of us have experienced the loss of a friend or a loved one. Back in November a year ago, one of my best friends started feeling sick. A couple of days later, he was having trouble breathing, so his wife rushed him to the hospital. He was put on a ventilator, and three weeks later, he passed away from complications brought on from COVID. Bill was only 52 years old. Bill and I played golf every week that year. We have been on vacations together, family vacations. We would even go on two or three golf trips every year. We were good friends. His daughter, Amanda, who turned 21 a year ago in November, she works for me. Now that she's in college, when she comes home for the summer, she still works for me. Since I've been friends with Bill for over 30 years, obviously I've known Amanda since she was born. A year ago in November, when she turned 21, that was the first, 
That was the first birthday she had to celebrate without her dad being there. So there are many times when I ask myself, what is golf going to be like without Bill? I start to get very upset, but now instead of putting on my mask and keeping all these feelings bottled up inside, I'll call one of my friends that also knew Bill, and we'll share stories. And then I think to myself, who's going to walk Amanda down the aisle when she decides to get married? If she ever decides to have kids, just like my daughters, they'll never know who their grandpa was. So I start to raise my mask again. Fortunately, through experience, I realize that wearing a mask doesn't do any good. So instead, I will pray to God and ask him to send the Holy Spirit to come into my heart and help me get through this. And you know what? Seems like it works every single time. Now more than ever, we need to look out for each other. This pandemic is affecting everyone in one way or another. We should be checking in with our kids, listening to them. We should be checking in with our family and friends and make sure that they are doing okay. Make sure that they are not trying to get through this all alone by wearing a mask. If we see our kids, our friends struggling, we should help them, not by talking to them, but by listening to them. And more importantly, we should be praying for them, asking God to send the Holy Spirit into their lives. I want to finish by reading a verse from the book of Revelations. I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. I wish I could stand here, tell you I had all the answers, but I don't. But this I can tell you with certainty. Every time that I blame God for the death of my dad and my brother, I had to put on a mask. And every time I let God into my heart, I was able to lower my mask. Folks, Jesus died on the cross for us. Now it's up to you. Are you going to open up that door for Jesus? Are you going to, you going to let God into your heart? Are you going to remove your mask? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Denise. Hello. So you just heard from my friends Luke and Bart about uh, how sometimes uh, we put masks on ourselves. But I'm going to approach, it, approach this subject just a little differently. And don't get me wrong, I also struggle with sometimes wearing masks, right? But sometimes I also struggle with putting masks on other people. And that would be by unfairly labeling other people. False labels. So this is my story. When I was in middle school, I had a really great group of friends in eighth grade. Um, we, were, we were mask free. We talked about Jesus, we talked about God, we talked about what's happening in our lives. If I sat at the, um, the lunch table and someone said, oh my gosh, I um, think I'm gonna try out for soccer. Let's all try out for soccer. I'm like, no, I'm good. I don't want to play soccer. It wasn't like, oh yeah, me too, just to fit in. But I moved. We, had, um, we moved out of state for my freshman year in high school. And this is traumatic because um, I was moving into a small town in Oregon with one high school, 100 people, 150 people in my freshman class who had grown up together. And I was coming in to this big group, this high school. So on my first day, I walked in, and I'm like, I'm going to be authentic. I am going to be myself. It's going to be awesome. But what happened was I, uh, I kind of freaked out. I walked in the cafeteria. I knew no one. I walked in, and I just saw the different tables, and I just labeled them in my mind. And I freaked out because I didn't know where I would fit in. So I put up the mask. I, I don't know where I'm going to fit in. I'm just going to shut everyone out. 
So it's kind of like, raise your hand if you've ever seen that movie, Mean Girls, where Lindsay Lohan comes into the cafeteria and she labels all the, um, the tables. I did the exact same thing. I labeled cheerleaders, preps, varsity jocks, junior varsity jocks, art freaks, desperate wannabes, bank nerds, um, ROTC guys who worked out all the time, unfriendly hotties, glee club, cool Asians, and then the Bible thumpers. Those were my labels that I just slapped on them based on what they were wearing, what they did for fun, um, who they were talking, what their conversations were. And so what I did is just, I sat at my own table and I put up my mask and I said, I, I don't wanna be a part of any of this. But it turns out the only table that had a room for me was the table of the, uh, the Bible thumpers who I labeled Bible thumpers. And it turns out they were pretty friendly. And the first day I overheard, this is a true story, I overheard their conversation and I seriously thought, oh my gosh, I cannot, I cannot just, uh, <laughs> this is not a good fit. They were arguing about the difference between the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed in a public high school at lunchtime in the cafeteria. Who does that is what I was thinking. Okay. Well, turns out, eventually, they became my best friends. They kept inviting me in. They kept asking me um, how I was. Well, how do you like math class? What are you doing after school? What are you doing Wednesday night? We've got youth group. They saw through, because I would let my mask down a little bit, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm doing okay, I guess, but like, it's really hard moving here. Oh, tell me more about that. No, I'm, I'm fine, just leave me alone. So eventually, I took my mask down, I let them in, and I found out that in their group, it wasn't just Bible thumpers, quote unquote. It was cheerleaders. Um, people on the, guys on the football team were in their group. They had some people in their group who uh, were in band and brought their instruments and sat uh, their instruments on their lunch table and still talked about, you know, like God stuff. But they talked about other stuff too. They were normal. They were normal kids, normal teenagers, and they were my best friends. My best friend Angela throughout high school um, became my best friend because she was the most mask-free person who got to know me as a mask-free person. God created us all very complex people. It is so unfair for me to just label all of um, the, the individual people at a table based on who they're sitting with, what they're talking about, what they're wearing, what they do for fun. And yet sometimes I still struggle with this. So this is also a true story. During the pandemic, my husband and I bought a house. We moved from St. Charles County and we moved to Franklin County, right? And I had thought, oh my gosh, Franklin County, I labeled it, Franklin County is the middle of nowhere. Franklin County is um, small, backwards. But we. Yeah, totally wrong, but that was my mindset because I had labeled, we go to uh, the parish. The very first time we go to mass, we're really excited. We're like, oh my gosh, this parish is beautiful. We, all these nice people, it's gonna be great. We're gonna get involved. We walk up to the door um, and someone, this lady, very well-dressed lady came through. She did not hold the door open for us. Instead, she let the door literally close in our faces. I labeled her as, man, what a jerk. That was my label for her based on that one interaction, which is so completely unfair. And let me tell you why. Fast forward a month, I join the choir. She's in the choir. I get talking to her. I'm like, I'm sure you don't remember this, but, and she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Turns out her husband had literally passed away the week before from cancer. And that was her first time out of the house going to mass and being around people. And I had labeled her as a jerk. Isn't that horrible? But think about it, how many times do we do this when our brains do it automatically based on one interaction with a person? That's not fair, and that's not how God created us to be. Luke said it very beautifully in his talk about the Holy Spirit moving through authenticity. And by me putting a mask, 
and labeling her, the Holy Spirit couldn't move in our relationship until I took that mask off and realized she is not a jerk. And it's a beautiful conversation that we had. And the Holy Spirit can flow in that. It's pretty awesome. So my challenge for you is don't label confirmation. And in my experience, sometimes this happens. Hashtag fun fact, I'm also an eighth grade PSR teacher in my parish now. Um, I see sometimes, and hopefully you're no, you don't do this, but maybe I did it when I was in eighth grade sometimes. I labeled confirmation. I said, confirmation's stupid. It's, yeah, don't label it because there are lots of different facets of confirmation. There's getting to know God. There's getting to talk with your sponsor. There's um, learning about the church history. There's doing service hours. There's coming to retreats. There's praying. It's unfair to label confirmation based on one facet, just like it's unfair for us to label a person based on one interaction with them. So my challenge for you is don't label confirmation. Uh, be open. Receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit at um, be, be sealed with them at the time of receiving the sacrament of confirmation. It's pretty awesome. My second challenge is to you, do not be quick to judge someone based on what they're wearing, based on what, who they're talked to, based on what they posted on social media, based on what activities they participate in, based on who they're related to or how much money they have, or their life experience. Don't be quick to judge. Instead, be open to getting to know that person because that's where the Holy Spirit is going to move in an authentic way. And if you've already labeled someone in your life, I challenge you to try to take down those masks that you put on those people. Be open to hearing their stories, getting to know them, because that's where you are going to be your most authentic self and it's how God created you to be. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to lead us in a little prayer about this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, Lord Jesus, help us just to be aware, more aware of the masks that we wear, of the masks that we put on other people. Help us to be more authentic. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so I mentioned before the drama that what we're going to do after the drama, and that's what we're going to do now. I do want to give you a heads up that there's going to be, we're going to give you a, a chance to talk among yourselves a little bit. I'll guide that process. And after you have a little bit of time to talk among yourselves, we will be having a break shortly, uh, so it won't be too long if you could just hang in there. Um, also, I know y'all have been sitting a while, so for this student sponsor discussion, and I should apologize because I know some of y'all are not sponsors, you're substituting for a sponsor, please don't be offended, but I'm going to call you a sponsor the rest of the day for the economy of words because um, it takes a really long time to say sponsor and or sponsor substitute or whoever the heck you are. So I won't do that. Um, I also want to let you know, since you've been sitting for a while for this student sponsor discussion time, I'm going to give you 30 seconds if you would rather move to a different location. So if you'd rather stand than be sitting, you can do that. If you'd rather move to a different part of the church and maybe sit uh, on the floor or something. All that I ask is that you would be within the sound of my voice because if you can't hear my voice, the discussion time that you have will not be as good because I'm going to guide it. So you have 30 seconds to move if you want to.
All right. Um, so this is primarily a time for each student and sponsor just to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, if you end up joining up with another student and their sponsor, I won't be mad. Uh, but for the sake of time, it would probably be best if it's a student and sponsor discussion time. Um, whenever I facilitate discussion times like this, I think it's really important that everybody would be on the same page. And for those of you who are live streaming, this would be a good time to maybe get your sponsor on the phone if you can or FaceTime them and you can follow along with us in the discussion questions. Um, so uh, I guess a couple things. Uh, one thing is it's important in a group discussion like this uh, to know, uh, well, let's pray first in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, please bless our discussion time, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, whenever I facilitate a discussion, I like to lay a foundation that I think is really important. The first thing I want to let you know, it is a time for y'all to talk to each other. Um, I want to encourage the sponsor in particular uh, to consider uh, responding to Luke's call to vulnerability. Because if you are vulnerable and you're honest, I have a feeling the student with you will follow. And if you're not, they might not. Um, so I encourage you. Um, also, I want to let you know whenever there's a discussion like this, even though there are discussion questions, it's important that you don't have to answer a question if you don't want to. I always tell my small groups, you can always say skip, or you can say pass, or you can just like look at the person next to you and be like, please leave me alone. Um, and the reason I want to give you permission to do that is I don't know about all of you, but I've had days where I wish people would leave me alone. Raise your hand if you've ever had a day, even once in your life, where you wish people would leave you the freak alone. Most of us have had days like that. If that day is today for you, please say it to the person that you're with. I hope they'll respect that. I would add to that, please talk, because if y'all don't talk to each other, this is gonna be really socially awkward. Like that, okay, so um, please talk. I also, um, We'll let you know, I'm gonna throw out questions and then I'm gonna say talk among yourselves. And when you're done talking among yourselves, if you could give me a thumbs up, that will give me a vibe to the room, how like most groups are doing. So a thumbs up would really help me. The first question I'm hoping the sponsor could answer first and then the student, and here it is. What's the worst sin that you ever committed and why did you do it? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Don't answer that question, I'm just joking. That was so funny. Y'all sponsors freaked out. Um, actually, what's amazing is now the students are curious. Uh, so, you're welcome. No, don't talk about that. I, I like to joke with that because that's like everybody's worst fear in a small group discussion. Um, actually, I was hoping the first question is that you could just do a check-in. And I'm gonna explain your check-in and then I'll check in to illustrate what I'm talking about. So here's the check-in. I find with people that I love a lot that sometimes I'm not checking in with them on a regular basis. So here is the check-in question. In the last couple weeks of your life, what's been going really well? Just what's good in your life in the last few weeks or so? And if you don't mind sharing with the person that you're with, in the last couple weeks of your life, has there been anything that's maybe been a bit of a struggle that you could just use some, I don't know, encouragement or support, or you just want the person with you to be aware of something that you're struggling with? Um, I'm going to answer both of them. Uh, sometimes both answers are with the same situation, and I would say that that's true in my life. Um, one of the things in my life lately that's been a little bit of a struggle is just dealing with the reality that my really pretty wife, Lisa, has cancer. She's had cancer for, uh, for a while. It's been over a year. Um, and uh, it's just really hard because every time we have a doctor's visit, if you've ever known anybody who's been sick, uh, in that kind of way, I get like super nervous uh, and she gets super nervous because we always fear what we might find out. Um, so that's just a struggle of dealing with that. When Bart was talking about the I'm fine mask and that temptation to wear it, this is where I'm most tempted to wear it and act like I'm fine, but I'm actually really scared and I'm really struggling. So if you could pray for Lisa, that would be great. 
Um, but also, along the same lines, what's really going well is that her last several doctor's visits have been really good. Um, and the medicine that she's taking is working, um, and things are under control, and the cancer is not growing. Um, and so, uh, even though it's a struggle, there's also been really favorable news lately, and that's going well, and that makes me really happy. And uh, it helps me to, I guess, just enjoy every moment that we have. So I know that's heavy, but that's just honestly where I'm at in terms of my check-in. Uh, that's something that I'm struggling with, but it's also something that's going really well. And I'm going to turn it over to you right now, and if each of you could share in your life what's going well and what's a bit of a struggle. And then give me a thumbs up when you're done. Go. Make sure you give me a thumbs up when you're done. That helps me. Okay, I'm going to give you another minute for that question. One more minute-ish. All right, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. So I need to say this. Um, I'm going to try to go at a pace that's reasonable, but if I'm rushing you, you don't have to answer the next question. You can go back to the previous one. I'm just going to try my best, all right? Um, so uh, the next question that I want to ask is just a survey question. Raise your hand if you feel like the whole masks thing is true that sometimes people are fake, sometimes people try to be somebody they're not. We all agree with that, me too. Then my follow-up question to that is you heard from Denise and Luke and Bart examples from their lives. Can you give an example from your life of a time that you were fake and what you learned from that? I know that might be hard to admit, but I would encourage you to consider. I will give you a plan B. I'd prefer that you take plan A, but plan B is you could give an example of a time you saw somebody being fake. However, if you describe somebody else's mask, I'd like you to be intentionally vague about that. 
no names. Because some of you know some of the same people. And I don't want anybody saying something like, yeah, this kid Kyle who won the game earlier, oh my gosh, that dude is so fake. Don't do that because it's probably not true. But the purpose is not to talk about people. That would be counterproductive. The point is to illustrate what we're talking about. So either a time you were fake or a time you saw it happening, I'm going to give you one of each really quick. The first time that I remember being fake was in seventh grade. Seventh grade Paul wanted to be really cool, and seventh grade Paul didn't know how to be cool, and grown-up Paul still doesn't know how to be cool, but whatever. But um, I, there was this group of guys in my neighborhood. I thought they were cool because they were like tough guys, and I noticed that they cussed a lot. And so seventh grade is when I started cussing around that group of guys. I didn't cuss around my parents or my teachers or my cousins because I really respected them, but I only, only cussed around that group of guys because they cussed, and I thought if I cuss with them, they'll think I'm cool, and it kind of worked, but it was really fake. I'm actually a really bright person. I have a really well-developed vocabulary. I'm an English major. I like words. But around that crew, it was four-letter words, you know? And that's just not authentic. So the cussing mask for me, a quick illustration of a time I saw it happening. I have her permission because if she was here, she would tell you. But my own daughter, Audrey, uh, started wearing a huge mask when she was in sixth grade. She became best friends with this girl who talked about people behind their backs constantly. And so my daughter started talking about people behind their backs constantly with her friend who did that. She went to a small Catholic grade school. If you've ever talked about people behind their back, you know a lot of times it gets back to them. And that happened. Later in her sixth grade year, my honest to God, my daughter would wake up in the morning crying because she didn't want to go to school because she thought everybody hated her because they probably did. And we talked about it a lot, and we saw a counselor. And my daughter, of her own volition, decided to apologize to each girl and guy in her class that she had talked about. And they all forgave her. They all forgave her. And she had a brand new start. But she was not being her authentic self. She's a really kind and beautiful person. But she fell into that trap. So that's an example of a time I saw somebody being fake. That's an example of a time I was fake. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, and what did you learn is the part B of that question. Either a time you were fake, you saw it happening, and what would you learn from that? And then give me a thumbs up when you're done.
All right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. I just have two more for y'all to talk among yourselves about. But the next one relates with Denise's uh, talk that she gave about labeling, about how we can label other people and not really get to know them for who they are. I would say another part of that is some of us have maybe struggled with being labeled unfairly. So uh, I'm going to ask about that. Um, can you give a real life example to the person that you're with of maybe a time you labeled somebody in a way that really wasn't fair? Um, or you can talk about, uh, have you ever been labeled in a way that's not really fair? And I'll give two really brief examples. In grade school, I was labeled um, as like the smart kid in my class. And there was some truth to that because I was pretty smart. I did well in school. I liked school. I liked my teachers. I thought they were really nice. I participated in class. But there were guys in my class who just made fun of me for being the smart kid. Uh, they, they gave me a nickname in grade school. They called me Braino. And they said, for fun, I like to drink Drano, which is so stupid, because if you drink Drano, you die, and I'm alive. But I felt, like, really kind of offended by that. And, like, some of my friends, they didn't want to hang out with me at recess, but they wanted to hang out with me if there was a group project. Um, and that label kind of bothered me. I've also been really guilty of labeling people in ways that I'm so embarrassed about. And I'll just say this, I think it happens very easily here in the St. Louis area for those of us who are St. Louisans. We can label people based upon where they go to high school. That really common question, oh, you went to Viz or Villa or Priory. And we sometimes make assumptions based upon that. We make assumptions based upon neighborhoods if we find out that somebody grew up in Frontenac as opposed to somebody else who grew up in Ferguson, sometimes we tend to judge and label without knowing people for who they really are. And I'm not going to give a specific example, but I'm going to say in general, I have struggled with that as a St. Louis person, and I'm fighting against it in my heart. So labeling. Have you ever been labeled in a way that's not really fair? Have you ever labeled somebody unfairly? Give me a thumbs up when you're done. weird things started to get really quiet so I'm gonna assume you're done um, with that question I'm going to move on to our final question my favorite question my favorite um, because it ends our discussion on a positive note I don't want you walking away from this session thinking great 
Everybody's fake, everybody's phony, life's terrible, because it's not that bad, all right? So here's the question. I'm going to ask it a couple different ways, not to insult your intelligence, but to be very clear what I'm asking. Here's the question. Who is the most authentic, mask-free person that you have ever known? And I want to clarify that I mean in a good way, not in a bad way. The reason I say that is one time I was leading a small group of eighth grade boys and I didn't clarify. And I was just like, so who do you know who's not fake? And this kid was like, dude, my brother's not fake. If he hates you, he'll just tell you. I hate you. You suck. I wish you would die right now. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who doesn't wear masks in a good way, that you respect and admire. Now, nobody's perfect. We all know that. So we're not saying somebody is a perfect role model, because nobody is. But who's the most authentic person that you have ever known, and why do you think of them as that kind of person? Here's my answer. I know a few people like this, but one of them is my very good friend, Dominic. Dominic is one, is one of my deer hunting buddies, which meant that during deer season, I spent more time with him than I spent with my wife, which might sound weird, but not if you're a deer hunter, okay? Um, but he is the most authentic person I've ever known. And one time I was hanging out with his little brothers, and his little brothers told me that they were considering having rubber bracelets made with the initials WWDD for what would Dominic do instead of WWJD? You see what they did there? They were not being sarcastic, although they frequently are. But in that case, they were like, for real, Paul, when we don't know what to do in a situation, we ask ourselves. And sometimes we ask each other, what would Dominic do in this situation? And we know that what our brother would do would be the right thing. I think that's really cool that younger siblings would look up to an older sibling with that kind of respect. My friend Dominic, one of the most authentic people I've ever known. If I lived my life by WWDD, I'd be a much better man. So that's my example. Please share with the person that you're with who's the most mask-free person you've ever known and why. All right, um, before we take a break, which we will very soon, um, I have just a couple, uh, uh, two challenges, I guess, and then closing comments to this discussion time. Here's two challenges. The first one is I wanna challenge you that whoever it is that you mentioned that you feel like isn't fake, I'm gonna challenge you to tell them. 
You even have my permission on this break that we're going to have to call them or text them and let them know that you thought of them. And the reason I want to encourage you to do that is I feel like we live in a world where we don't say enough positive stuff to other people. Raise your hand if you would agree with that statement that we could be much more positive toward others. Same. All right. So the other challenge that I give you is to live your life in such a way so that other people would think of you when asked that question. I don't know about you, but I think it would be cool to find out that when I'm not around and when people are talking about me, like, how cool would it be to find out that everybody's like, oh my gosh, Paul, like, that guy's the real deal. He is so authentic, and I appreciate that about him. That would be so honoring. And we all have the potential to be that kind of person, especially students, if we enter into everything that God wants for us through the sacrament of confirmation. So the first challenge is to tell that person. The second challenge is to be that person. Finally, just a couple quick words about why. People have asked me, and it's a fair question, a lot. People have said, Paul, why is the first thing that you talk about on a confirmation retreat masks? What does that have to do with confirmation? I believe it has everything to do with confirmation because I think confirmation is about a decision to follow Jesus to be the best versions of ourselves. And I think the best versions of ourselves are, is us just being mask-free. If you need, need a little background, a little backup on that statement, a couple quotes from people who knew what they were talking about. Um, one of our Catholic saints, St. Teresa of Avila, she said the beginning of the spiritual life is self-knowledge, which means we need to know who we are because who we are is who God loves. So this masks thing is all about self-knowledge. Father Shamanad, one of the founders of the Marianists, said what is essential is the interior, which means it's really essential that we know who we are on the inside. And we not cover that up with a mask. Pope St. John Paul II, he once said to a group of teenagers, I urge you to remove the masks of your false self. And finally, uh, this is just one of my favorites. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 2711, it says that in prayer, what we do is we take down our masks and we open up our hearts to the one who loves us the most. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close. Um, so I think this has a lot to do with confirmation. I think it's important for all of us. Students, I want to be clear. We are not saying to you that y'all got issues because y'all are fake. We all struggle with this in different ways. But it's really important to keep it on our radar. We are going to move into a 15-minute break. Susan's going to say a couple really quick things about this break that are really important. For those of you who are watching on live stream, we are on break until 2.45, but we will be starting up promptly at 2.45. Come on up, Susan. Don't break until she says stuff. As a reminder, restrooms are around the corner here and also downstairs. We also have opened Ursuline Hall. You can access it through the door that's at the parking lot if you would like to use restrooms there. If there is not that need, we ask that you just kind of stand and, and take it as a break here, but not stand in the gathering space and socialize. We would really appreciate that. Otherwise, we will see you at 245. Thank you.
All right, welcome back from our break. We're going to uh, just move into our next uh, serious session of the retreat, um, and we're going to do so uh, by doing another one of our dramas. And uh, to set up this drama, I'm going to ask everybody to try, uh, just if you don't mind, try to use your imagination. Um, there's just two ways that I'd like you to use your imagination during this drama. One is I want you to pretend uh, that Bart is Jesus. So who is Bart? Right. Uh, but not real life, just pretending like, yeah, imagination. So Bart is playing the role of Jesus in the drama. Another way that will help you get more out of this drama is you, if you use your imagination and I want you to pretend that Luke is everyone in the whole wide world. So who is Luke? Right, so we have Bart playing the role of Jesus, Luke playing the part of everybody in the whole wide world. The drama is called Jesus Stay, S-T-A-Y, Jesus Stay, and we hope you like it. Oh, hey Jesus, how's it going? It's good? Okay, great. Um, it's, I'm glad you're here, you know, it's good to see you again. Actually, you know, I have a lot to share with you. I was on a retreat today, um, and we talked about like masks and being real, and uh, you know, I, I'm actually not doing anything this evening. Would you wanna hang out? Okay, awesome, yeah. Um, well, let's, oh shoot, you know what? It's Sunday night, isn't it? And I completely forgot that I have to do some advanced algebra homework first. Um, shoot, we should get that out of the way and then we can do whatever you want. Can, can you help me actually with that homework? Yeah, oh, because you invented, you know, algebra and everything. I forgive you, that's fine. Um, well, hey, I'm glad you're gonna be able to help out because you know, you're omnipotent or whatever. So let's crack open uh, the math binder. Okay, first question. One plus one equals Uh, I don't know, Jesus, what do you got? I mean, that's pretty difficult um, for peace. No, I don't think the answer is peace, Jesus. This isn't religion class. This is social studies. This is math. And I know you're all about peace, but we're looking for one plus one, Jesus. Little bunny foo-foo, I don't like your attitude. No, this isn't theater class, Jesus. I, again, um, we're looking for one. Disco dancing. It's not music class. Come on. I mean, have you ever been to a math class? One plus one. What is it, Jesus? One. Oh, two. Oh, it's two. Wow. Why don't you just say that? Goodness. Okay, one plus one is two. Perfect. Okay, second question. Ooh, double digits. Ten minus ten. That's like four digits. It's more than double digits. I don't know, Jesus, what, can you, can you help with that one too? Okay, yeah, can, I, I, it's not okay that you're not answering this more directly. Uh, 10 minus 10 is, I see you, I know, telescopes, I don't know why that's the answer to 10 minus 10 though. You're a ballerina. Um, nope, man, we should really practice our charades, Jesus. Uh, power of the people, yeah, that's not the answer either, maybe, maybe. Safe baseball. Oh, do you like do you like baseball? Yeah, I bet you like the Cardinals, huh? And the Pope, and you know, and the bishops, all of them, huh? Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, but hey, that, we need we need to get to, to the homework. Ten minus ten. Just get. Come on. Please help me out, Jesus. Please, please, please. Okay. No, you're giving me nothing. You're giving me nothing. To, oh, nothing. Oh, the answer is zero. It's nothing. Okay. Ten minus ten. Zero. Got it. Okay. Third, final question. Whew. Long division, 25 divided by five. Carry the seven. I don't know, Jesus. I, I, th this is way too hard for me. I really need anything you can do to help me that I'd really appreciate it. Some divine inspiration or something, I don't know, because 
25 divided by 5 is, you know, high five, sure. You just reject me, Jesus? Come on. <laughs> yeah, all right. Oh, high five. I get it. Okay, okay. Yeah, there we go. High five. Okay, perfect. Well, hey, we're done with homework. Done having, you know, getting the busy stuff out of the way. Uh, what do you want to do now? I mean, again, I'm, I'm free the whole evening. Like, did you have anything in mind? Yeah, what's up? What's this? The, the Holly Bibble. The, oh, oh, the Holy Bible. I've heard about this. Yeah, don't the, like, other types of Christians read this? You know? Um, well, I, I don't know. What do you want me to do with this? Well, again, we're bad at charades to get, oh, you want me to, oh, you want me to read it? Are Catholics allowed to do that? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, let's see. You want me to read th this page right here that you opened it up to? Okay, a reading from the book of Revelation? Okay. Okay. Behold, and Jesus said, Behold, I stand knocking at the door of your heart. Whoa, sound effects. Holy God, how did you do that, Jesus? That was awesome. Here, I want to do it again. That's pretty, I mean, if I knew this is what reading the Bible was like, and Jesus said, Behold, I stand knocking at the door of your heart. Whoa, what's, what? Oh, is that actually the door? You're not making sound effects. Okay, that's fine. Well, hey, let's go see who's at the door. Yep. Hey, Luke. Hey, Luke. Hey, uh, Denise. Denise and I are here. Um, we were just wondering if you're doing anything tonight. Um, nope. Totally free. Nothing going on. Great. Yeah. Because there's going to be a party, and we thought we would invite you. Oh, I, yeah, I'd love that. Nothing like a Sunday night party in Kirkwood. So. Oh, I know. It's going to be a rager. Yeah. Um, so uh, we thought, I thought I'd tell you who's going to be there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're interested. Um, so uh, Raymond is going to be there. Nice. Everybody loves Raymond. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, so it should be a really good time. And Anna and Elsa may show up. Mm. So it'll be chill. Um, so it, I think you should totally join us if you're not doing anything. Yeah, I'm totally free. Let me just go ask my parents, you know, so I'm going to be out of the house. Uh, I'll be right back. Just All right, cool. Mind. We'll be here. Hey, Jesus, how's it going? Yeah, um, so obviously you were right over my shoulder listening to everything I was saying in there. But um, Paul, Denise, they just invited me to go to a party. I'm really excited. I haven't hung out with them in like a whole day. Um, I know I said we were going to hang out this evening, but... We can do that another time. Don't worry. I'm going to go with them. You can just stay here, okay? Okay. Hey, Denise. Uh, yeah, oh, I, my gosh. Luke, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm, 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 oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you answer, okay. let, let me tell you a little bit more about this party. In fact, I heard from um, my friend that uh, her friend Penelope is going to be there, and she was asking about you. P P yes, Penelope. Penelope was asking about me? Yes. Well... <laughs> Well, geez, gosh. <laughs> like, I know. I didn't you know should... that Penelope was going to be there. So, um, well, hey, um, if that's the case, I need to go actually like change my outfit a few times because yeah, I got to look. Oh, thanks. Oh. Um, I got to go <laughs> rest Penelope, so just hold on. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Jesus, I can tell you're like eavesdropping a lot right here, and um, it seems like you want to go along, but listen, normally maybe, but Penelope's going to be there. You know I've been praying to you a lot about Penelope, how cute I think she is. And I just want to be able to focus on being with my friends, looking cool, getting to know Penelope a little bit better. So I really need you to just stay here, okay? I'm going to go. You just stay here. Okay, are we ready to go? All right, Luke, um, we think you should hurry up because it's taking you a long time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you heard. I don't know if you heard, but there's going to be a lot of beer at this party. Really? And if you don't hurry up, the beer is either going to be warm or it's going to be gone. And both of those are bad. Oh, uh, yeah. So, that's definitely bad. do you want us to leave without you? No, 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 no. I promise I'm coming. Just give me, just give me one more moment. I put my fish in the blender, and I need to like take them out really quick before something terrible happens. So, just give me one more moment. Hey, Jesus, listen. I can tell you really want to come with me, okay? But, you know, this isn't your kind of party. You know, there's going to be beer there. I, I hear you're more of a wine guy, anyways. Like, actually, why don't you come over here? Why don't you sit down? Okay, well, make yourself comfortable. Here, read this thing. I, I hear the whole second half is about you. Reminisce about the good old days with the buddies. But I need you to stay here, okay? Because I'm going to go to this party. I'll tell you all about it next time in confession, okay? Okay, okay Luke, you ready? You ready? Okay, we yes, have got to go. Ready. 
we have got to go now. The car is running, gas ex expensive, and really honestly, so is beer. Yeah, okay. Yes, I know. Listen, I'm, I'm coming right away. I told my sister earlier today I play hide and seek with her. I haven't seen her in a few hours. Let me just go fix that really quick. I'll be right there. Okay. Jesus, I said stay! Get up. Jesus, what part of what I was saying to you didn't you understand? I told you to stay here. Hi everybody, I'm Paul. Hi, um, and that was our drama called Jesus Stay. And it's my privilege, and it really is a privilege for me to offer a few reflections to all of us um, on that drama. I find that drama to be really powerful. I also find it to be really true. What strikes me as very real about that drama is when I introduced it, I said that Luke was going to play the part of everybody in the whole wide world, and I think he did. Um, I think Luke played the part, I know Luke played the part of me. Perhaps he played the part of you. I don't know your life. But I will say that the part that Luke played reflected my life because of this. In the drama, Luke had a relationship with Jesus, and it was real. Now, I could be wrong, 
But I have a feeling that all of you probably have a relationship with Jesus. In the drama, Jesus was Luke's friend. He hung out with him. He chatted with him. He asked for help with homework. I don't know if you've ever done that. But even though Luke had something authentic, he also had a situation that came up in his life. And students, if you haven't yet, someday you will have a situation that's going to come up in your life where you, like Luke had to decide, am I going to include Jesus or am I going to exclude Jesus? And when he excluded Jesus, when he said no to him, when he said, Jesus, stay, which is the name of the drama, I think we all saw what that did to Jesus, right? It just broke his heart. And I want to be really clear with all of you this afternoon. The reason that it broke Jesus' heart to be excluded from Luke's life, it's not that Jesus wanted to send Luke on some kind of guilt trip. That is never the case. The reason it broke his heart is that Jesus just wanted to be with Luke. Students, students, you're learning a lot of really, really important things as you're getting ready for confirmation. I believe, this is just me, I believe that's the most important thing, is that Jesus wants to be with you. But the choice of whether to include or exclude Jesus is totally up to you. Students and sponsors, nobody can make that decision for you. Students, your sponsor cannot make that choice for you. Your parents cannot. Your teachers cannot. Your priests cannot. The archbishop cannot make that choice for you. It's a very personal decision. Are we going to let Jesus be a part of our lives or not? And I also want to let you know that the reason Jesus wants to be with us is because he's crazy. He is. He's crazy about you. And he's crazy about me. And if you've ever had the privilege, and I know some of you have, had the privilege of being crazy in love. When you're crazy in love, you want to be with the one that you love as much as you possibly can. And that's God's heart toward you and toward me. But again, the drama illustrates the reality that each one of us have to answer that question. Are we going to include Jesus or not? And I want to illustrate that reality with a very simple visual illustration for you that has really helped me in my life, and I share it in the hopes that it will help you in your life. To me, it's a lot like this. Excuse me. This is just a glass of milk, that's all. But I think we're all kind of like a glass of milk. Not totally, but kind of. Here's how I think we're all kind of like a glass of milk. We're all created good. This milk is good. And you're created good. And I'm created good. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before, that you're created good. I just said it. You just heard it. Raise your stinking hand. Okay, right. We're created good, and God loves us, and that's an amazing thing. If we could believe that we're created good, we have original goodness. Even though we struggle with original sin, we have original goodness. God created us good, and if we can believe that, oh my gosh, it changes everything. We're created good. And yet we live in a world where it's hard for some of us to believe sometimes that we're created good. There are all these things coming at us that can make, and make us question our goodness or make us question, does God really love me? And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story, just a little bit. I believed that I was created good when I was a little kid. Do any of y'all know any little kids? Raise your hand if you know any little kids. Little kids can be annoying, I know that. But little kids, generally speaking, know that they're awesome. 
When I was a little kid, my parents told me I was awesome. My teachers told me I was awesome. My priests told me I was awesome. And they all told me that God thought I was awesome. Dude, I was freaking awesome. I was an awesome little kid. I loved life. It was amazing and good. But then this thing happened in my life that made me question, am I really good? Does God really love me? Here's what happened. I don't know if you've heard of it before. Middle school. Have any of you heard of middle school? Raise your hand if you would agree that middle school can be difficult for some people sometimes. All right. I'm just going to tell you middle school was really difficult for me. And I started to question, does God really love me? There were three reasons why I struggled with trusting in God's love in middle school. One is prior to then I didn't struggle. But in middle school, I started to struggle a lot with my looks, with my physical appearance. I know you might find that hard to believe, but it's true. I struggled a lot. I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's a secret that's going to shock you half to death, but only half. When I was in middle school, there were actually girls that liked other boys more than they liked me. <gasps> I know, shocking, right? Um, but it was really difficult for me, and I didn't like how I looked, and I struggled with my self-image, and a lot of really good people do. And I started to question, does God really love me? Because everybody always tells us that God created you. And then I think he created me like this. Why, God? Second reason why it was hard for me to trust in God's love in middle school is I became very aware of what a big sinner I am. Raise your hand if you've ever sinned. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying, and that's a sin. Join the crowd, dude. All right, so we're all sinners, right? We all mess up. We do really stupid things. Y'all sponsors were freaked out earlier when you thought you might have to tell the student that you're with your worst sin, okay? Sin produces a sense of shame and embarrassment, and sometimes when we sin, we find it hard to believe that God could really love us. But the third reason is the biggest reason for me. In middle school, it was hard for me to trust in God's love because life started to hurt really bad. In middle school, I saw a lot of really bad things happen to really good people that I really love a lot. And I started to question, God, if you really love us, if you really love me, then why did my gra grandma die? Why did my parents fight? So to go back to my analogy, like, I was created good, and you're created good, and God loves us, but it's almost like we're incomplete. So check this out. When we're baptized, we receive the best gift a human can ever receive. We all receive it when we're baptized. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a lot like Hershey's syrup. I mean, Holy Spirit, Hershey's syrup, same initials, coincidence? I think not. So we receive this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. And the Holy Spirit is God's way of reminding us of how much he loves us because he knows sometimes we forget and he knows that sometimes we struggle. And the Holy Spirit is poured into all of our lives when we're baptized. And we receive a lot of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized because God is rather extreme in how he is constantly pouring his, lives, his love into our hearts. Should I keep going? Oh, yeah, a little bit more. Okay. So uh, the Holy Spirit is an amazing gift. Students, sponsors, you know the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, which means God comes to live in our hearts through faith when we're baptized. This is so, that's a lie. This is so cool that God loves us so much, he wants to be within us all the time. Another thing about the Holy Spirit, which I think you probably know, but I want to remind you, is the Holy Spirit is really powerful. It says in scripture that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that the universe came into existence. I don't know if any of y'all have, have studied astronomy. I have a bit. The universe is really big, y'all. It's like bigger than Kirkwood, okay? Um, and the 
power that created everything out of nothing is within you and within me. And it's this gift that God gives us when we're baptized. But I want to be real with you. This is just my story. But when I was going through the confirmation process, like the students here are, I would hear my priest and my religion teacher, people like my sponsor, and they'd always talk about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. But my experience at that point in my life was, so what? What's the Holy Spirit done for me? The Holy Spirit ain't done nothing for me. Now, in this visual illustration, I think it's pretty obvious to the average person that something needs to happen to the chocolate that is within the milk in order for the milk to be transformed by the power of the chocolate that it has received. Are you picking up what I'm laying down here? Are you mopping up what I'm spilling? Not literally yet. Okay, so what needs to happen? If you could say it, that would help me. You got to stir it up. And those of you who are close might be able to see that this is not only a big old spoon, but it has holes in it because it's a holy spoon. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist another dad joke. Uh, but, the, right, we have to stir it up. And I'm going to stir it up in a couple minutes. But before I stir it up, I want to tell you how it happened to me in the hopes that it'll help you understand how it can happen to you. I believe the Holy Spirit was supposed to get stirred up in my life when I was confirmed. Students, sponsors, in case you didn't know, the reason the Catholic Church offers you the gift of confirmation is so the Holy Spirit can be stirred up in your life if it hasn't been stirred up yet. And if it has been stirred up, it can be stirred up more. That's the reason for the sacrament. It's a really cool opportunity. And it could have, and it should have, but it didn't for this kid because I had what my religion teacher in eighth grade probably would have called a bad attitude. I don't know if any of y'all have a bad attitude. Don't raise your hand if you do. Uh, but my bad attitude was I didn't care about God, faith, and religion. I was really vibing with what Luke said earlier about being made fun of by his friends for wearing the Got Jesus t-shirt. My friends, when I was in middle school, made fun of people who were into their faith. And I didn't want to be made fun of, and I didn't want to feel like an outcast. So I effectively did in my life what you saw in that drama, Jesus Stay. And I said, Jesus Stay at home but I can't bring you to school with me. And because of my bad attitude, and because of my fear, I don't know if you've ever been afraid, but like I was afraid of what other people might think about me. The Holy Spirit did not get stirred up in my life when I was confirmed. I have countless regrets about that. I don't even have time to express my regrets. But I want to give you hope because something finally happened in my life that gave me the courage to begin this process. And I'm really glad it happened. Students, when I was a little bit older than you, I met somebody and I had an experience that changed my life. First of all, I met somebody who wasn't fake. Sponsors, this is where your role is so important. Honestly, it's really important in the lives of the young person that you're with right now. It took me till I was much older where I met somebody who was a role model of faith for me. And I started hanging out with this person who wasn't fake and we became friends. And I realized that this person who was really engaged in his faith he was happier than me, he was more peaceful than me, he was more authentic than I was, and my heart cried out for that. So as we became closer friends, my friend invited me to an event. It was a really important foundational event in my life. He invited me to go see a Christian rock band in concert, which may sound weird, 
and it was, all right? But I went to see this Christian band. Music was great, but between songs, the band members were kind of like us on the more team. Here's what I mean. They would get up and talk about things they'd been through. I honestly tried to ignore it because I had a bad attitude. But this one person in the band got through to me. He just told his story. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. You've connected with somebody else's story. But this guy talked about being fake. I could relate to that. He talked about being hurt. I could relate to that. He talked about wanting more out of his life. I could relate to that. And then he talked about Jesus as if he knew him. And I couldn't relate to that. Did you hear what I just said to you? Been Catholic my whole life, still am. This guy talked about Jesus as if he knew him. As if he had just had breakfast with him that morning. Because he probably had. And I knew that was what I needed. Concert goes on, whatever. End of the show, the same guy who had told his story that I connected to, he got up and he said, you know, he said, I just want to pray with you. If you would like to have a deeper relationship with Jesus than you currently do, because he would love to have a deeper relationship with you than you currently have with him. And so that really honestly sounded good to me to pray. So I was sitting down, just like y'all are sitting down, and I thought, sure, I'll pray, you know, so I closed my eyes or whatever. And then the guy said, but if you want to pray with me, I'm going to challenge you to do something rather difficult. I'm going to challenge you to stand up right now out of your chair as a sign of your commitment to Christ. And when he asked us to stand up, I couldn't do it. So I didn't do it, because I was afraid. Again, fear. I was afraid. What will people think about me if I stand up? Will people laugh at me? Will people make fun of me? I don't want to stand up and be some kind of outcast. A few people stood up. I was like, whatever, man, I don't know. And then the guy who was talking, he paused, and he said, before we pray... I have a feeling that somebody out there might be afraid to stand up, which was me. Maybe you're afraid of what other people might think about you if you do stand up, which was me. And then he opened up his Bible, and he read this verse. And I had never heard this verse before, but it's really there. Check this out from my perspective. He read a verse where Jesus said, if you stand up for me in front of other people, I will stand up for you. In front of my Father in heaven and all the angels on judgment day. But if you deny me, I will also deny you. I don't know about anybody else in the universe. All I can tell you is for this kid, Paul, in that moment I had two choices very much like Luke's character in the drama. I could say yes to Jesus by standing up, or I could say, Jesus, stay, by staying in my chair. And honest to God, it was the most difficult thing I had ever done in my life up to that point. But when the guy gave us another chance to stand up, I did. And when I stood up that night, nobody laughed at me, and I prayed. I don't remember the words of the prayer. I don't remember the name of the guy who led the prayer. But I'm going to tell you that when I stood up that night, I made a commitment to Jesus that I had never made before. And I'm absolutely convinced that what happened to me that night when I stood up for Jesus and I prayed a prayer is this. The Holy Spirit that I had received when I was baptized, that could have, should have, and I wish would have been stirred up when I was confirmed, it finally started to get stirred up in my life. Just a little bit. Did that concert totally change my life? No. But it was a really important decision. And then I started doing those things that my religion teachers always told me to do, but I never really did, you know what I'm saying? I started doing things like praying, and I liked what happened when I prayed. 
I started reading the Bible, found things in there so helpful and encouraging and inspiring. I started giving things like youth group a chance, and I'm so glad that I did. I started trying to figure out what does our church teach and why. And I came to find it to be true. And all I can tell you is because I've tried to be open to having a relationship with Jesus, I'm a different person. And I believe that my life tastes better. It's a little bit strong, but that's okay. Um, and the key to this happening in my life and the key to this happening in your life all goes back to the drama Jesus day. As I wrap up, I want to tell you that it's okay with me if you forget every word of this talk. I don't care. But I hope you'll never forget the drama Jesus day. The drama Jesus day contains the key to everything that you and I need to know about having the Holy Spirit stirred up in our lives. Because if we bring Jesus with us, the Holy Spirit will be stirred up. And if we don't, it won't. Because the Holy Spirit is His Spirit. Now, before I stop talking, um, I want to pray with you. Um, and I want to let you know, I don't want to pray with you to show off with fancy words, because that's not me. I just want to pray with you for a moment to return the favor. Because one night at this one concert, this one guy, he led a prayer for me and with me. And that prayer jump-started my faith. And I believe that a prayer like this could be helpful for you. So for this prayer, I'd like to ask you a really big favor. I know it's a lot to ask, but why not? It's your confirmation retreat. If you could just bow your head and close your eyes, that'd be so nice. Just so you don't distract other people and you block out all distractions. And with your head down and your eyes closed, I'd like you to think about your life just for a moment. Here's what I'd like you to think about. Would you like the Holy Spirit stirred up in your life? Maybe you're like I was at that concert. Maybe this is the first time you've ever asked for it like this. That's okay. Or maybe the Holy Spirit is stirred up and you just want it stirred up more. Either way, God would be thrilled to stir up the Spirit in your life. And God does that when we ask and when we invite Jesus to take more control of our lives. So... Keep your eyes closed. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to encourage you to repeat the words of the prayer out loud after me. Only if you want to, repeat after me out loud. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for loving me and for creating me good. Lord, I'm a sinner. I've worn some masks Please forgive my sins and help me to go to confession anytime I need to. I commit my life to you. Help me to live for you every day. Stir up the Holy Spirit in my life. And Lord, make my life more like chocolate milk than white milk. Please keep your heads down and eyes closed a little bit longer. Here's why. We've experienced on our retreats that since God is so crazy about us, sometimes, not always, but sometimes when we open up our hearts to God, God likes to do things. So we're going to give God permission just for a couple minutes if God wants to do anything. God, some of us might need to feel it today. And it's okay to sometimes need to feel something. So if you want to give any of us just a feeling or a physical sensation of your love, we're open to that. Maybe that tingly feeling that we can sometimes get. Maybe a surge of joy. Maybe just a feeling of peace. 
or an awareness of your presence. Lord, some of us need healing. We're kind of broken. Some of us have been hurt so bad. And some of those hurts have come from the people who were supposed to love us the most. So if you want to bring any healing to our broken hearts, that would be nice. I think the Lord wants you to know if your heart is broken, so is his. It's broken with you and for you. And he's with you. Lord, some of us need courage. We just need more courage to stay close to you. Our courage to come back to you. To make a good confession, because we've drifted. And we need help to come back. Please keep your heads down and your eyes closed just a little bit longer. Just a little bit. Here's why. You heard my story. At that concert, it was very important for me to stand up. I'm going to give you an opportunity to stand up. Not, don't worry, not just like in, like in that way, but here's what I'm going to give you a chance to do. As your own way of standing up, as your own way of saying, yeah, Jesus, I want to be closer to you, with your eyes closed, I'd like you to raise your hand. That's your way of standing up. And if you'd rather not raise your hand, you can raise your pinky or your big toe. But it can be really good to physically acknowledge, yeah, Jesus, I really mean it. I want to be closer to you. Please keep your eyes closed. Put your hands down. I want to give a second chance to those who might need a second chance just to raise your hand or raise it up a second time. And everybody, go ahead and put your hands down. <clears throat> and everybody, please look at me. One of the things I've learned about chocolate milk, this kind in particular, is that you have to keep it stirred up. What I stirred up a few minutes ago is already settling back down to the bottom of the glass. We have some advice for you on how to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up, but not now. Before we do that, you're just going to have a couple minutes to talk among yourselves again. Denise is going to facilitate that process. And after a little bit of discussion time, um, we'll begin the process of wrapping it all up today. Hello, my name is Denise. Hello, and I'm going to lead you through discussion. So let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, please bless our discussion time. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So first, and it, it works the same way, we ask that the sponsors please answer first. Be as vulnerable as you can. Set the example, um, and it invites the Holy Spirit into your discussion. It's awesome when that happens. We're very blessed to have this time together. So the first question is, what struck you, or what do you most want to remember? Um, or what were you thinking about during the drama, Jesus Stay? and or during uh, the talk on Commitment to Christ chocolate milk that Paul just did. So for me, the one thing I would want to, or what I was thinking about the most, is definitely about um, just being stirred up. How in my life, I see so many people who are um, baptized, like I think, I assume all of us are baptized, and we've had the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts, just like everyone baptized, poured into our hearts, and it's so many people are just living that and not living their faith, not stirring up the Holy Spirit in their life. Um, and that's what I was thinking about, like how many of the people in my life, I'm very blessed and I know a lot of people who are living like this, where the Holy Spirit stirred up in their life, they love Jesus, they love their faith, they're mask-free, they're authentic Christians, and they are so active and love the church and all of those things. But then I know there's a lot of people in our, in our life, in our ministry, who maybe don't. That's what I was thinking about. And I want to remember from the drama, like it's so easy for us to make that quick decision, Jesus, stay. Stay in this part of my life. Stay at home. 
stay. Um, I went to public school, so for me it was stay at church. Don't come to my public school with me. Just stay. Stay there. Uh, stay at meal prayers at home. Uh, even with my family, family, let's leave Jesus at home because when we go out to eat, I don't want to pray in a restaurant. That's super weird to me because then people are going to look at us and know that we're Catholic. Not just Christians, but Catholic, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Yeah. So I want to remember, like, that's a visual, a strong visual for me. I want to take Jesus with me in every part of my life. I work in customer service. I take Jesus into every phone call with every customer of every school with me. Honestly, it's really hard to do sometimes, but I do it. Yeah. So for you, go ahead and discuss what struck you or what you, were you most thinking about during the drama Jesus Stay and or Paul's talk with chocolate milk. And give me a thumbs up when you're ready. All right, guys, next question. And if you did not get to finish that question, totally just after I give you the next question, keep answering or go on to the next one. It's up to you. But the next question is, who is someone in your life who is a role model for you in your faith? This could be someone who lives their faith well, has the Holy Spirit stirred up in their lives. They are living their life like chocolate milk, like this. So for me, I'm very blessed. I have um, a few people in my life who... Um, live like this. But I will tell you the number one person is my husband. My husband and I, we pray together. He prays every day. He reads the scriptures every day. We go to mass very frequently. And I just see in him, and this is fun fact, hashtag fun fact, a uh, part, of, part of being in the sacrament of mar matrimony is you're supposed to lead your spouse to heaven. And I'm very blessed he's leading me to heaven. And so he's mask free, he is definitely my role model in faith, which is awesome. So for you, go ahead and discuss who is someone in your life who is a role model for you in your faith? Who is someone you know that um, lives their faith well, has the Holy Spirit stirred up in their lives? Go ahead and discuss and give me a thumbs up. It just gets quiet all of a sudden. It's awesome. Okay, so let's close our discussion time with the prayer. We are going to um, wrap it up with a few more, more talks, but let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, dear Jesus, just thank you for blessing our discussion time. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, our next person, because now we get to give you the practical advice 
of how to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in your life. So first person we're going to hear from is Erin, who is from your parish, and she's going to introduce you and talk to you about youth ministry. Hello, my name is Erin. And um, Paul told me that I should start off with a joke, so I was, this is a little, uh, a little closer, is that better? Okay. Um, intimate with the mic here. Um, so he told me I had to tell a joke, and so the joke I'm going to do is the joke that my four-year-old daughter gave, did on Halloween. So why did the chicken cross the road? Why? To get hit by a bus. <laughs> Right? I told Paul, and he was like, wow, that's good. You're going to say that. So, um, Anyway, I am here to speak on behalf of the youth ministry program here at St. Peter. A lot of you know SK, Sarah Kate, our youth minister, who cannot be here today. So she asked me to come out and invite you guys to a few things. So one of the things is um, next weekend we're actually having a movie night. So we want to see our eighth graders there. And then we'll also be having another high school, like after you guys find out about high school acceptance or just decide, you know, we're going to celebrate that in February. Sorry, I have notes. Um, and then we also will be, you guys will be participating in the Luke 18 retreat, which is the retreat put on by our high school students here at St. Peter. So they plan it, they run it. And then you guys get to come hang out with us for a weekend. And it's amazing. And then after that Luke 8 routine retreat, you guys will be invited to come weekly to our youth nights at St. Peter, which is after the 5 p.m. mass on Sundays um, in the youth room. And Sarah Kate puts on different activities, and her core team helps her plan that and all that. So, um, And then the last thing to think about, just planting the seed, is that we will be going and taking a group of high school students down to the Steubenville Youth Retreat this summer. We'll either be going the first weekend of July or the second weekend of July. So SK will have more information on that too, but also super fun. I highly encourage going on that because it's just a great time to hang out with your friends, but also have God in your life. So thank you very much. I think that's all I have for you. So. Hi, my name's Luke. Hey, how's it going? And I have the pleasure, the honor of sharing with you all the, the last talk of the day. So, aw, or yay, or however you want to feel. Okay, stop. So, <laughs> um, no, uh, it's been great being with you today. Um, and I'm going to share kind of our, our third piece of practical advice of how to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in your life. Um, as humans, we're more than spirit and soul. We've been talking a lot about our spirit, our hearts, our souls today. We're also human beings. We're, we're physical beings here on earth. Um, we've just heard about how to keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls with things like, um, like youth group, regular attendance at mass, prayer. Um, and um, what I want to share with you is how we uh, can say yes and keep the Holy Spirit stirred up in our life with the virtue of chastity. Um, so let me go ahead right off the bat and say I'm going to give a much broader and clearer definition of chastity than you might have heard before. Because um, what I'm not up here to say is, hey, save sex for marriage, see you later. I want to be here to give a much broader and purer definition of chastity. I'm going to do that in six points. One, chastity is a virtue, which means it's a habit of doing good. Um, which means that it's something that we choose over and over again. It's not a one-time decision. It's not a... I made a decision and that's it. It's something that we choose over and over again. And that goes in the second part of this definition is that it's for all vocations, it's for all points of our lives. Whether you're married, you're a, a, a priest or a, or a religious sister, or you're single as a Pringle, um, chastity is for you because it's a habit of doing good. And it comes to the third part. It's a habit of doing good that focuses on respect. Respect for the act of sex, for the theology of sex, for the opposite sex, so much that we reserve sex, all sexual actions for and in the bond of marriage. And it's more than just the fourth component here. So it's a virtue, it's for all vocations, it's about respect. 
it's more than just our bodies. Like I said, we're, we're more than body of, than heart and mind. We're also body. And in a similar way, chastity is more than just our bodies. It's about our heart, mind, and soul. The fifth component of this is that chastity is always about the future, and it's not about the past. So it's a habit of doing good that you can pick up at any point in your life, no matter what yesterday looks like. And finally, chastity is a, is a yes. It's about saying yes to Jesus, and it goes into what we're talking about with confirming confirmation and bringing the Holy Spirit into our life. What I want to boil this down to, and, and again, why I didn't just want to say the one-liner and leave, is because sex is good. The Catholic Church tells us sex is good because sexuality is a part of being human. We're humans. We're created in goodness and likeness. And we don't have to live in this, you know, cloud of shame and guilt when we think about sexuality. But sex is also a mind-bogglingly powerful bond. And it's good, but because of that powerfulness, because of the bond it creates, it is meant for the exclusiveness, the faithfulness, and the eternalness of marriage. And that's what we believe in practice as Catholics. Let me use a quick analogy. Sex is like a fire. A fi think about a fire in a fireplace. It's warm, it's comforting, it's good for your home. But what happens if that fire is no longer in the fireplace and it's on the floor, or it's in a closet, it suddenly becomes dangerous and damaging. And in the same way, sex outside of marriage can be dangerous and damaging in our own lives. And let me explain that in two ways. One, because sex is such a powerful bond that sex outside of marriage inevitably damages our heart, our spirit, and our mind. And of course, can have unplanned consequences on our bodies. But even more dangerously, what I believe is that it exponentializes heartaches. And even worse than that, it damages us even further by numbing us and robbing us of the power of recognizing the magnificence of of sex. I think that a great tragedy in our culture and our society today is just that numbing. And I don't know where you're at in your life, and that's why I say chastity is always about the future, it's not about the past. But if you're in a cycle of just feeling numb, like it doesn't matter, you have the opportunity every day with this virtue to choose something different. And so that's what I want to focus on, just to, just to share why are we talking about this on, an, on, an, on our confirmation retreat? Why is it important in eighth grade that you're hearing about this? The first time I received a similar talk like this, I was in middle school. And I'm glad I did hear it, even though when I was in eighth grade, I was far off from dating or being in an actual physical scenario where I, was, where I was going to have to say no to sex, to premarital sex. I didn't date in eighth grade. I didn't date through most of high school. Not my decision, but girls' decisions, but that's fine. Um, but it was honestly, it was good for me. It was good for me in my path that I was not um, in a dating scenario or worrying about dating until, you know, much farther into my future. So please don't be rushing into that, you know, um, if, if don't, don't feel the pressure like I did a lot of times in my life that that was the norm. But why was it still important that I learned about this in eighth grade and started choosing it? It's because I needed to learn about it and to hear about it for two main reasons, again, two. Let me focus on those. One, even though I might not have been in physical scenarios where I was going to have to be saying no to a temptation, there are unhealthy depictions and treatments of sexuality still around us constantly. Social media, music, movies, online articles, the constant availability of pornography or suggested images on our Instagram feeds, just lunch table conversations with the guys, sexuality is all around us. Right now, everyone in this, age, in, this, in this church right now, no matter what age you are, it's the truth. And I've long been able to see chastity almost like rain, uh, like a gutter guard or like rain helmet. So if you're, you know, picturing like a house and on, you know, there's the rain gutters and some people have like that little helmet that fits over it so that, you know, when the leaves fall or the twigs come, it kind of rushes right over, but, you know, the, the water can still enter the gutter. In a similar way, embracing chastity gives us a filter that we can place on our minds and our hearts that just more easily allows just the gunk, the crap, to move on and not infiltrate us. However, even embracing chastity, it's even more of a need to put on important filters in your life and recognize when, um, you know, it's not a good opportunity or not a good time for you to be on your phone or to you to be alone in the scenario or others. We still need to be um, conscious of those filters. 
So the first reason why it was really good for me to start learning about chastity at this point in my life and thinking about it was because I was already in at least mental situations, even if I wasn't yet in physical ones. But the second component is that I needed to start saying yes to chastity before I did find myself in the scenarios where I needed to be saying no to a physical situation. I learned about it from a retreat like this. I read a little bit more about it, honestly. I didn't just like walk away from the retreat. I'm like, yep, sounds good, sign me up. I actually like went and read about it and learned a little more and thought about it and prayed about it for a while. And that gave me more conviction and more reason to continue choosing it when the tougher temptations did come down the road. So as I wrap up, I just want to share with you, you know, a few quick reasons why living chastity, you know, when I was in middle school, high school, college, as a young adult, has brought goodness to my life. Uh, it's not just like a rule, and it's like, hey, here's the rule, here's about it. Again, see you later. I want to share why I think it's, it's brought more fulfillment. More fulfillment. Um, one, it allows me when I'm dating to date more worry-free. I know that when someone is dating me, um, they're interested in, in me and who I am and not just what I am. And there are way too many friendships that I, you know, heard about, I knew about, especially in high school, where that, that, that relationship that this person was in should have been broken off months ago, if not years ago. But there's so, especially with that strong bond of sex, there was an addiction there where either the breakup was not, never happened or never happened soon enough and it was never clean and it came with more hurt. And I knew that I was not going to be in those scenarios. We introduced you to more of a, a worry-free reality that who I'm dating, we're dating each other's hearts and souls. Secondly, it presented no regrets. So in a similar way, when I was breaking, when, you know, a, a relationship was being broken off that I was in, I was not leaving behind a part of me that really, you know, retrospectively, I'm like, man, I wish I could have given my entire self to my future spouse. Thirdly, it challenges me to be more creative in how I show affection. Um, especially brings me into having to think about how to have more creative dates. You know, I can't just be like, oh, well, let's just hang out on the couch and watch Netflix. I have to be more creative to, of course, pull ourselves out of tempta um, you know, temptation or, or moments that are tempting, but two, to show affection beyond just this stamp of, well, if you love someone, you have sex. Because there's so many other ways and amazing ways to show someone that you love them and living chastity has forced me to become more creative in that realm and then fourth and finally as i start to wrap up here chastity prepares me for the yes and the constant yeses of marriage and or my vocation that i'm not gonna suddenly be on a on a altar someday saying yes to, to my bride to be you know for example and hope that in that moment i will have suddenly just absorbed character from that moment. Saying yes to chastity now builds my character up and is allowing me to say yes, even when I am single as a Pringle, to something greater in that hope. And so what I want to leave with you with is just a few challenges. One, I encourage you to learn, think, and pray more about chastity after this talk. Pray about who you follow on Instagram, about who you idolize in general. Pray about how you dress or what you post or what you say and talk about in conversation and if that leads others farther from good. Pray about how you want your current or future relationships to protect and respect body, heart, mind, and soul. And maybe even think about how you hope that your future spouse right now is being treated by others or treating themselves. And pray for your future family to find motivation and hope. And finally, pray to the Holy Spirit for the grace to choose and continue choosing and confirming yes. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Paul. So we have a gift for you, and then we have some closing announcements before we cut you loose. Um, the gift that we have for you is really cool. A lot of people have found it really valuable, even though some people might find it awkward. 
I don't care. In just a moment, we're going to make available to everybody, everybody here today, a little business size card. It's called a chastity commitment card. It has words on it. I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it for yourself later or have a friend read it to you if you would prefer. Um, but it basically has this pledge. If you would like to make a decision for chastity and a place that you could sign it or you could put the date that you signed it or both. Now, we intentionally are not going to hand out pens and pencils. We're not going to have a signing ceremony with candlelight and creepy music because that is not our style. We are just going to make a chastity card available to everybody here. And as Luke recommended, we're going to encourage you to think about it, pray about it, learn more about it. I believe it's the second most important decision that a person can make in their lives. I believe the first is that decision for Jesus, where we say yes with our hearts, as some of you did when you raised your hands a little bit earlier. But chastity, as Luke said so clearly, is how we say yes to God's plan with our bodies, and we are whole people. I want to tell you one really cool story, super quick, but it's really cool. Uh, Quite a few years ago, I led a retreat that was kind of like this, and I ran into a young man who was on that retreat. His name is Jason, several years later. And we started talking about the retreat and the content, and he brought up the subject of chastity. And he said, I'm really glad you talked about chastity on that retreat, and I want to let you know that I actually took your advice. I said, well, tell me more about that. He said, I did not sign my chastity card right away. I really did think about it. I really did pray about it. I really did learn more about chastity. And a couple months after his confirmation retreat, he decided he wanted to practice the virtue of chastity. So he signed his chastity card. He put the date that he signed it. No big ceremony. It was actually by himself in his room. Tucked it away in his wallet. My friend Jason went on. He dated a couple different girls when he was in high school. He dated a couple different girls when he was in college. But a couple years after graduating college, Jason met the one, you know, the woman that he knew he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. And he decided to propose to her in a way that was really cool. Young men, take note. Someday, if and when you propose, do it in a way that's cool, okay? The girls are all like, preach. Okay, anyway, uh, so what, this is what Jason did. He set up a romantic night, and when the moment seemed right, he got down on one knee, handed her the ring, and said, will you marry me? And she said yes. But while Jason was still down on one knee, he reached into his back pocket. He pulled out of it the chastity card he had signed when he was 14, and he gave it to her in that moment. And he said, I just want you to know that I've been waiting my whole life for you. Whew. How cool is that? And I just think the chastity card can be a really cool thing. And because Jason and a lot of other people have had really powerful experiences, we want to make them available. We always tell everybody, we'd like you to take at least one. If you're currently dating somebody, you can take two. If you're currently dating several people, I don't know what to say to you right now. You got issues. But um, we're gonna <laughs> And then they call each other out. It got weird. Okay. Um, but the team is going to help. I guess Denise and uh, Luke are going to take care of distributing the chastity cards. Um, and they're going to pass them so you, got, you can, like, take as many as you want. And they're just going to do their best with this. Uh, it'll be a little chaotic. And as they are doing so, if you could... Take these and pass them down and continue to listen to me. That would be great. On your way out of the church, after we've had uh, a closing prayer, I want to highlight that in the gathering space back there, we have a free stuff table and we have some really good stuff available that we believe could help anybody attending this retreat. If you're interested, no pressure. But I'm going to tell you about some of those things so you know what's on our free stuff table. We have free rosaries. And here's a cool thing about the rosary I learned recently. Even if praying in an entire rosary is not your thing, 
or it's challenging for you, a good friend of mine said recently, if we hold a rosary in our hand while we pray, it's like holding Mary's hand when we pray. And I like that because I think Mary's really cool. Uh, we have some flyers of things, just things. So we have a flyer about a couple books that I wrote with all of you in mind. We have a flyer about a Good Friday retreat that's being offered at our retreat center. Uh, it's going to be a nice half-day retreat to just reflect on Good Friday, one of our holiest days in the church. We have a flyer about a monthly prayer gathering we have at our retreat center in Eureka. It's like a mini retreat. Um, and the next one, um, I'll be there. Uh, we also have this flyer, which we encourage every teenager and young adult who is here to take, even if you take nothing else. This green flyer has the word suicide on it, and it, what it does is it offers you advice on how to help a friend. If a friend of yours ever struggles with losing hope, it's a, it gives you advice on how to be there for somebody. Sometimes people just need a friend. We have this really cool little prayer card. Uh, it's a Marianist prayer. It's called the 3 o'clock prayer. You don't have to pray it at 3 o'clock because, wait for it, it's 3 o'clock somewhere. You'll get that when you're older. Um, we have this really cool flyer on things that Pope St. John Paul II had to say to St. Louis teenagers in 1999, but the messages are timeless. They are so good, teens. We have this. This is one of my favorite prayers of all time. This is a prayer card, and it simply says on the front, Jesus, I trust in you. Powerful prayer. There's another prayer on the back, which may or may not affect you, but it might affect somebody that you love. There's a prayer card. This is for the canonization of Father Shamanad. He is one miracle short of being canonized a Catholic saint. So if you need a miracle, as I need a miracle, uh, maybe you could write that prayer request on here. Pray this prayer. Who knows? You could get an all-expense-paid trip to Rome for his canonization process. I don't know if that's really true, but it's fun to say. Um, also, we have a couple stickers. If you like stickers, I like stickers. Um, your water bottle could be as cool as mine if you would like a stirring it up sticker. This is just about stirring it up. Remember how I stirred it up and it got stirred up? This is a, this is a sticker um, that says, do some more, be some more, live some more, because this is a s'more retreat. This one says, pray some more. Um, and I think there is one thing, last thing, on the free stuff table that is not free. And I want to explain why it's there. There's a glass jar, and it has a label, and it says, donations. Please do not take our donation container or its contents. But here's why it's there. The Moore team receives a financial gift for presenting this retreat from this parish. We are extremely grateful. But we're an outreach of the church that we will not be able to expand what we do without the support of people like you. So we have a donation container. And I, but I want to let you know that if you're able to give half of all donations support our outreach. The other half we send to a Marianist school. It's called Our Lady of Nazareth School in Nairobi, Kenya, where for $135 a year, a kid gets an education and one hot meal. And we've heard that some of the kids get their hot meal and they don't eat it. But they bring it home to their family members who otherwise might not have a hot meal that day. It's a really cool ministry, and if you're able to support both of those efforts, if you don't have money today or you can't, don't worry about it, but we do have envelopes if you'd like to send something in later, and I do have Venmo, and I hope that you could trust me to get things to where they need to go. Uh, if you're able to support us, great. If not, that's okay too. Do you have some things to say in conclusion? Yes. So um, our final words will be from Susan, and she's kind of a rock star, so give her a round of applause as she comes up to the microphone. First, I'd like to say thank you to Paul and Denise and Luke and Bart 
thank you so much for being here and for presenting to us. Thank you. And thank you so much to all of you and to all of our participants live streaming also. We thank you for coming. And lastly, could we please end in a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for being here with us today and help guide our confirmation students on their journey. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much. Have a good day.